<clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh, Chrissy here with Dave Smalley. For um, I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, I'm David. Uh, I'm the host of uh, Dogma oh. Debate at davidcsmalley.com. Can you hear me? Chris, can you hear me? Hello? What happened? I feel like I lost you. Oh, it says your mic is muted. So you should be, we should be good now. Sorry about that. That was my fault. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I forgot to mute the other window and it was echoing oh, in my was ear. Okay. Yeah, I, I couldn't hear it. I'm really good at that. <laughs> I'm very professional. All right. So I should ask the, the, um, the chat now, since I did that, if they can, <laughs> do you guys out there, is everything good now? It sounds, it seems like, uh, yep, they can hear us both. All right, good. So if you want to start again and. Uh, as long as, as long as Vadim can hear us, we all know he's the most important one out here. <laughs> yes, we'll okay. see. Then, not, then, then we're good. Um, so yeah, my name is David Smalley. I host Dogma Debate. Um, I'm at davidcsmalley.com if you're curious. I'm also a stand-up comedian, an actor, podcaster, voice actor, things like that. So uh, go check out Dogma Debate on Podcast One. All right. And I will link that when this is over. So that will be cool. All right. So uh, Dave, as many people will know, uh, was at MythCon, as was I, but he had a lot more jobs to do. He was on a panel as well as being the moderator of a panel. And it happened to be the, the panel that he was on, which was, um, oh, what was it called? Something about the division in the secular community or? So I was, I was on the first panel, which was the, the political, how, how uh, there's been a political divide within the atheist community. And then I moderated two more panels. So oh, okay. I, was actually, I actually did three total. Oh, see. You were very busy. So, um, and that was the first one that we had there. The The first panel, uh, there was a an exchange that he had, which at the time very much upset me. Um, I didn't actually see, and to be fair, I did not see the full exchange because I was upset enough and, and we'll be showing it in a minute that I got up and, um, left with my middle finger up in the air and uh so i didn't know about the middle finger so that's <laughs> i wasn't aware the whole time even though we've talked i had no idea that the middle finger I, was part of the that's cool though it's fine yes i completely <clears throat> flipped you off and most of the most of the crowd so oh. you know that's um were you sitting we, near the front were you i was sitting front? right by the front Oh, I wow. might have so actually you, been in like the front front row or the like you got second to walk one down. Long time. You got to walk for a long time with your middle finger up. I did, but you That's know, cool. okay. <laughs> um, but we managed, so that was fine. Um, and we had kind of a, I would say it was a fraught discussion afterwards. Okay. Somewhat emotional. Um, yeah, they, they grabbed me. I mean, I came off stage uh, the moment. I stepped off stage. Uh, someone literally grabbed both of my arms uh, and said, uh, you need to come with me right now backstage. Uh, someone needs to speak with you. And I said, I have to go to the bathroom. And he was like, no, that happened late. And I was like, I'm going to piss myself. I have to go right now. And he's like, no, this is very important. I was like, you're going to have to wait. And I ran to the bathroom. And then I was calm and came out and I went, okay, what's on fire? Like then I could focus on what was going on. And they said, uh, you've really upset someone and they would like to speak with you privately uh, with a moderator. And I went, oh, okay, what happened? And they didn't tell me. They didn't tell me your name. I didn't know anything that was going on. When I walked into the room and I saw you sitting there with, I believe it was Melody. Yep. Um, that was the first, I just, I was completely just like a deer in headlights. I was like, 
when I do? What happened? What's well, I, I had asked them, like, I didn't ask them to march you and goose step you off the stage and not let you pee, but I had <laughs> asked them to, uh, I was sitting with Melody and I had said, you know, I really feel like, because we were going to be on stage together. I said, I just, I don't feel like I, I could just go on stage without having talked to him first and, and sort of gotten this stuff off my chest. And um, so, and Melody, Melody's wonderful, by the way. Nobody knows who the heck we're talking about. She's a lovely, <laughs> she's a lovely woman who is there helping out at MythCon. Um, very sweet. And so we had the conversation and I think it was, you know, it, it was difficult and I, I think it was just sort of one of those situations where when you have an emotional kind of visceral reaction to something, um, it can be very difficult to sort of put things aside. Um, but we did talk about it and we I talked mean, about the room. I want you to know when I walked into the room, uh, the thing that concerned me is I noticed you, you were visibly trembling. I mean, you were, you were, you were like you hear the term shaken up you were literally yeah. trembling so i knew whatever it was whether i agreed with your point of view or not it had affected you deeply i could definitely tell that it did um but you know and and i'm, I'm calmer now <laughs> um so uh, i guess we should probably just show it because otherwise people are going to be like what the hell are these people talking about so mm -hmm. let me pull it up So at this point, I'll kind of set the clip up. We were talking about uh, skepticism within the atheist community. And uh, I believe the question posed to me, and I'm sure you'll, you'll play this portion, uh, the moderator who is a godless spell checker, Stephen Knight, he picked me and said something along the lines of when, when does, when has, give me an example of when um, atheists aren't being skeptical or when skepticism and atheism part ways or something along those lines. Right. And I should ask the chat again, can you see, can you guys see the uh, screen that I'm sharing you? Just so you know, I see it. Okay. So if you see it, they can probably see it. So, and as you can see, I have like a million things open. I usually do. Yes. Okay. So I've got the yes and we will go then. <clears throat> And um, hopefully, if you if you watch the chat for me and let them know if they say that there's a problem with hearing it, they sh it should be okay. I don't hear it. I I don't hear it. Okay. Should they? Is it possible that I don't hear it and they do? Um can't hear they can't hear it shoot uh so in your uh in your google hangout settings do you use a mixer no <laughs> um so let me i've got to if i'm going to use this i've got to stop screen sharing for a second let me okay. get my settings um uh, okay I oh i know what i can probably do okay cool if you got it if you don't, if you don't get that, I think if I play it, it'll probably come through because I've got a mixer set up as my audio, so I All can right. play the audio clip at least from from my end as a backup plan if yours doesn't work. All right, actually, yeah, let's try that because it's okay. it's being weird on me. So <laughs> I will screen share and then. Um, can you link that to me so I can click the exact same thing you have? Oh. So we're at 34 minutes and 14 seconds here. I've got this on your. Um, can, can you just put it in the chat, in the group chat? Oh, you sent it to me on Twitter. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually having trouble finding the group chat. Just let me say, no, nope, that didn't help. Oh, okay. What? How? How far down was it? 
Uh, 34 minutes and 14 seconds is where I'm at. 34 minutes and 14 seconds. All right. I'm going to hit play. You ready? Yep. You think you can hear it. Here we go. Called out. David, so we've touched on this topic of skepticism now. Um, thank you. So, so what, what are the key topics that um, separate skeptics from atheists that, that you've noticed? Things that you can touch on where you can realize, oh, okay, well, this person doesn't believe in God, but they're not behaving rationally on other topics. What are some of the things that flag this up to you in your world? Oh, this is one of them. This is a perfect example of, especially within an online community, if you will, of people saying things like, I'm a skeptic, I demand evidence for your claim. Unless that claim is about sexual assault, then there's no evidence required. Let's destroy this person's career. So you're not in the, um, in the camp of automatically believe Accusers. Not automatically, no. I think they should be taken seriously and looked into and investigated and not, not blown off, because that's important. But as, as Jacqueline was saying as well, I, I've, I've, I've said things before, consider myself liberal. Okay, we and, can stop it there, I guess. Uh, would you say that's a fair place to stop? <clears throat> I can't hear you. All right, uh, is that about where it ends i i think so um i mean we can keep playing it to see what happens next i don't know if it gets okay. any deeper. No, i'll fine. keep going but when i say the left is doing this and i'm talking about antifa or something that ridiculous that's happening on the left and I'm okay yeah we could stop that's just mike up front cheering for antifa and laughing it, it just kind of goes off into that uh, yep that would be mike <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that was it. And, and I think you actually left um, d after the first applause break, whenever I said something about the evidence, uh, I think that's what upset you. And I think you didn't hear the second part where I said the claim should be taken seriously. We should investigate it, but not ruin someone's career over just an allegation. Um, uh, so yeah. I think it, it wasn't just what you said. I think it was the rock star applause you got for it. Like, uh, as a person who had, who's been assaulted, it, it was incredible. It was a visceral feeling of having all of these people around you just cheering their asses off for that was, um, it kind of blew me away. What so did they, what did you think they were cheering for? Um, well, you know, not everybody cheers for the same thing. Right. But uh, I've been on the internet long enough to know that some of them were cheering for rape culture. Some of them were cheering for misogyny. Some were cheering for the idea, um, as we've seen in this week, that uh, there are a lot of hostile sexists out there. These are people who do not believe women. they are people who don't trust women, don't like them. Um, they have beliefs and attitudes towards them that are, um, at best condescending, um, and at worst borderline violent, you know, and, and some are, some people, some men are violent towards women as well. So you just don't know what mix you're, you're in there with, but it certainly doesn't lend to a feeling of safety to have them cheering quite so loud for something like that. You would hope that there would be something more of a muted, okay, that is, I can understand what he's saying, but instead you go, woo, don't believe sexual assault, but, you know, but that's, okay, that's a that's, bit that's, intense. That's, hey, that's an interesting <laughs> point. Here's, here's my, my take on it. Um, I think that, so the, the panel, the people who were there to watch that panel were watching atheism and a political divide and, and skepticism. Um, and that question was posed for me to what's a way that people have been atheists, but not behaving rationally. And <clears throat> the reason that one came out at me first, that the, the sexual assault allegations came up to me first is because um, I'm a, I'm a victim of sexual assault. I was molested as a child. Mm -hmm. And 
I didn't speak up about it until my little cousin was also victimized and he spoke up. And then I felt responsible for what happened to him because I thought if I had told, maybe the second one wouldn't have happened. And I have to live with that guilt for the rest of my life. Hmm. Um, so I know what it's like to be a victim, to be shamed. And I was believed um, because I was the second person to come forward. I gave all the all the information. I was only eight or 10 years old. I think I was eight when it happened and about 10 when, I, when it came out and I told. Um, but I know, I know what that shame is like. I know what it's like to hide that and to not tell anybody because the child molester was very smart in weaponizing shame to say, right. you can't, if your mom finds out what you did, you're in so yeah. much trouble. And so I felt like I was going to be in trouble for, for what happened. <clears throat> so I very much understood all my life. Um, and, and I'll tell you this too. When people in my family, when my grandmother and aunts and uncles found out that he did this, they protected him. Hmm. They were afraid my mom was going to file charges, so they paid to send him somewhere in hiding to keep him away from the authorities. So yeah. we didn't even know where he was to file charges. So then I felt completely like abandoned by my own family. So this, this did I've been there. I've been that victim. I've, I've been, and he denied it, of course, uh, until later. I will say well, I was in my mid twenties. He came back around, came clean about everything, told everybody I told the truth and apologized to my cousin and I. And um, he somewhat still has a relationship with the family, probably more so than I do for the people who turned their back on me. Right. So I, I get that. Um, but I'm also a victim of false accusations. And I hope we get into that. I know on Twitter, someone sent you some screenshots. Um, five years ago, I terminated two people from working for me who were uh, not only doing a subpar job, but saying racist, ridiculous things into my microphones. And I didn't want to continue supporting that. So I let them go. Five years later, they see a shitstorm about me on Facebook. People are T calling me a Nazi and a rape apologist and all these ridiculous things. And they use that as an opportunity to try to get back at me for letting them go and then accuse me of something I didn't do. And it wasn't sexual assault. It was more of a, and they said I made an inappropriate request, which actually the request was made of me by them or by one of them. And I turned her down. And now five years later, that's being flipped on me and, and, People took it. Christy Winters ran with it. People retweeted it. Uh, Secular Student Alliance was like, oh, we're so embarrassed that we invited David Smalley to speak. And I'm going, what? When Christians come to us and say, Jesus came back to life, we go, where's your evidence? Let's talk about it. When you say, Jesus came to me in a dream, we go, that's not evidence. That's your anecdotal thing. But anybody on the internet can just go, David Smalley asked me to do something sexual and suddenly all of these atheists who are skeptics, who demand evidence and everything else are now willing to ruin my reputation. Christy Winters explicitly tweeted, if you financially support David Smalley, stop. He is a sexual predator. And I, I sent you the screenshots of some of the things that she tweeted about me. It got a lot of attention. It got a lot of retweets. And I can show you my Patreon growth. That was the month it stopped. And it has been, and it has been on a decline since then. So now my, my, I'm, I'm suffering financial loss because of it, because of false allegations and a bunch of atheists who in every other scenario seem to be generally good, genuinely good skeptics. This one thing, they're willing to ruin my reputation, shut down my finances. They don't care how I support my daughter, what I do in my life or grow my brand or deconverting Christians are all of that's thrown away despite my charity work, everything else, nothing else matters. The evidence doesn't matter. My life, my growth came to a screeching halt because of a false allegation. Now that means, number one, this person making a false allegation is very, I think, disrespectful to actual sexual assault victims who make the same claim and are not believed. That is sad. That is heartbreaking. That also means she is victimizing an actual sexual assault survivor in me by accusing me of something I didn't do. And so when he asked me the question, think of a time when atheists have not behaved rationally. 
that's the thing that resonates with me most because I saw all of these people who I know actively debate Christians and they just believe it without evidence. They just take the person's word. And I, it made me sick to my stomach that I was lumped in with people who, who had been proven um, to have violated people. And it, it really, it really messed me up. And it was sad and it was disturbing because that person who made that allegation, she knows. She knows the story. I'll tell you the story if you want to know it. She knows the story. Her, she propositioned me to do something. Her boyfriend said no. I agreed with her boyfriend, said I'm not going to do that. He's right. That would be inappropriate. And now five right. years later, two of them I, came up. I do want to. Yeah, that's why That's why that was on the tip of my tongue. I want you to know that. Okay. And all right. So I'm going to say as, as a skeptic, I'm agnostic on this. Like, I don't know you. I don't know these other people. I don't know anything about your situation. You know, uh, it's completely you know, I have two conflicting claims and absolutely no way to evaluate them. Well, I do have some evidence for you, though. I, I do like they after that alleged night in question, which mm -hmm. it was all it was, is it was a we, we shared a hotel room. And right after I checked in, she was saying, hey, we should do stuff, all three of us. And we should. It was I would I, no, I would be more. I wouldn't. There, there wasn't a whole thing. They continue to be on my show. For I think eight to ten months, every single week, they were at my house doing more shows after this alleged incident. So if they felt threatened or somehow in danger by me, why would they continue that? That makes no sense. Well, I'm not, again, that's not something that I can answer. And they're not here to defend themselves and they're not here to say, well, this is our side of the story. So and I, wasn't there, and I wasn't there on Facebook the day they made that allegation that had a devastating impact on my life and i i understand you know i can understand and I, I hope that you understand where i'm coming from i'm not trying to be cruel i'm very the, sorry the, right this isn't court i mean if i'm going to deal with that i'm going to deal with it right. in, a, in a defamation lawsuit uh mm -hmm. i'm gonna the, the facts will come out if i if i decide to pursue that i will so you're right this isn't the place to do it but i want you to know that as a victim myself mm -hmm. it felt extra disgusting to me to have false allegations made about me and then to see atheists pass this around and just decide that I'm a terrible person and say all these horrible things about me with no evidence whatsoever. And that's right. why I answered the question that way. I never, I, I would have never said, don't believe women. I would have never encouraged anyone to cheer for sexual assault or to say, don't believe any woman. Absolutely not. That would have never been my stance on that. Mm. And and I am I'm very sorry about what happened to you as a child and what happened to your cousin. And I I can't imagine that's terribly painful. Um so I think at this point where and we talked a little bit about this beforehand, you know, obviously this happened completely independent of the Kavanaugh hearings of all of the things that have been going on. And then, you know, so we have this, this thing that we've scheduled to talk about um, this event. And now it's like, okay, so, but so now I'm, I'm going with, well, how can we make this conversation more productive than just, I have a grievance or you have, um, you know, uh, your side of the story that you want to tell or that there's like some personal issue over something that was said in, in one conference somewhere in Milwaukee. How can we do something um, more productive that, that might go somewhere? Um, so I, I think maybe if we talk about the issue of skepticism, of uh, how one might best deal with people coming forward, how we could be productive without, um, and what's the, what would that look like? How could things, because right now, the, uh, the last thing around these kinds of allegations, they've, they've been devastating for so many people. Just watching this 
for people who have been victims watching the Ford and Kavanaugh hearings and the fallout. I have so many people, you know, every day telling me that they're depressed, they're exhausted, they're angry. So I guess I, I was thinking if we sort of took this, now that we've set the stage of why we started this in the first place and people can make of that what they will, maybe now it would be better to say, well, what can we offer um, as victims, as people who have had these situations in their life that might be useful for people to hear? So I don't know if there's anything you'd like to say to that. Yeah, and and I, I, I do, and I appreciate that. And I think I like how we got here. I mean, uh, you know, obviously the way that came off to you was upsetting to you. You left. Um, and then afterwards we sat and talked and I think at first you were, you were really sort of like not even wanting to share a stage with me in that moment. You were thinking he's going to be moderating a panel I'm on in a couple of hours. I don't want to share a stage with him. And I didn't really feel like it was going to be appropriate to go out and address that grievance on our intersectionality panel. I felt like that would do a disservice to the topic of intersectionality. And so uh, I just offered to come on your YouTube channel and, and discuss it openly. So th this open discussion is exactly what I was hoping for. So I appreciate you taking me up on that and, 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 and following through. Um, this is so difficult because someone, first of all, sexual assault, it, it, it can be tough to define. Um, Sometimes, I mean, in, in some of the surveys that have been done, I'm sure you know mm -hmm. this, uh, it's, they'll say, have, has anyone ever, they'll be like, you know, in your four years of college, have you ever had this happen, this happen, this happen, this happen? And those things will range from flat out rape, and they'll talk about penetration and things like that, and then they'll go to, or forcibly, uh, you know, forcefully with violence, been forced to kiss or perform a sexual act. And then sometimes some of the surveys will go as far as to say someone um, touches you in something that could be seen as a sexual fashion, even over the clothing, which could mean something as like you're at a party and someone grinds on you and you turn around and go, get off me. Um, but if that's all lumped together, that could give this inflated view of rape. And so I, I want to be, I want to be careful that like, it, it's not, when we talk about like, like I, I feel even weird calling myself a survivor and I just want to, I want to be clear about that because on one hand, yes, I, I, I live, I survive day in and day out with what happened to me. Um, and I, I think I'm making the most of it. I confronted my, my molester and, and we don't have a relationship today, but he apologized and I had some sort of closure um, but at no point did I ever feel like my life was in danger in the moment, right? I wasn't, I wasn't held down and, and forcefully raped. I never thought I was going to be killed. It wasn't to that, to that extreme. And so I feel like if I were to call myself a sexual assault survivor, even though I was molested as a kid, I would feel like that would not, I guess it's almost in a way devaluing what women have gone through and, and men as well, but mostly women have gone through being actually raped, you know, and, and had their life threatened. And I was never that, that person I would call a survivor. I wouldn't call myself a survivor. So we have this, this nuance of what does it even mean to be sexually assaulted? Now from that, we want to be skeptics. We want to make sure we believe true things and reject false things we don't want the victim to feel like they're not believed. So this is all important stuff. And you made a good point. Whenever we sat down and spoke, you said the first thing you should do is, are you okay? And I think you're exactly right. If someone were to come to me and say, I was just sexually assaulted. Are you okay? Are you safe now? Are you hurt right now? That's number one. That's a great point. I learned that from you and I appreciate that. Step two is, like in my situation, and you asked everyone, you asked everyone at the event, why do you believe David Smalley when he says he was, you know, that this happened to him or whatever? Go so, well. The, the key difference there is, I've never, like my, my my molester isn't running for Senate, or isn't going on the Supreme Court. 
he doesn't have a Twitter handle. I can tweet it and try to get him fired from his job. I think when you expect ramifications for, for what was done to you, then I think more evidence should be required. And I think that's where we may differ on this because the sad part is that some people, some women, and I know this from experience, will attempt to use this new culture of, you know, the me too and accountability, which are good things in principle to then destroy people they don't like. And while you may be thinking, well, that's a small percentage, it's like 9% or 10% of, 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 I don't even think it's, it's that high. Honestly, well, whatever the, whatever, I, the, the statistic I heard was 9%, even if it is lower. What if you're in that percentage? That's me. That's a real life situation for me. And it was massively impactful. So from an individual perspective, it's so hard. And so I don't want to reject the claim right out, but I also don't want to just, it, it becomes a, like a witch trial. It becomes, he touched me and I right. just can fire him. And that's not okay either. Okay. So, so there's, there's already a lot to unpack here. <laughs> um, I and I probably should have made notes. So I think you're first talking about the, the, um, the studies that were done by Kay. Um, was that her name, I believe? Um, uh, mine came from the AAU, the one that okay. I was using. But there's also uh, another one that there were just the two universities that they did. Another hmm. one they did a study of 27 universities. So sometimes, I, I think this is a commonly held misconception where they did ask about that, but they asked about a whole range of things, but they didn't necessarily and they'll say, they said right in the study, we're not counting this as rape. It's right. not being lumped in. So it's not, it wasn't part of their percentages. Also, in some of these studies, um, they were asking not just did this happen at college, but did this happen since you were, I think it was age 13, which one would also assume, you know, if you were assaulted at age 12, you were going to say so. You know, like I, 13 seemed like an odd um, you know, it might as well have just been, have you been in, has this happened to you at any point in your life rather than choosing a 13 year old? Um, so I, I feel like that there are a lot of, there are a lot of misconceptions about that study. And so I, I just would, um, I will look it up again and, and put it in the description. I have a lot of things to put into the description anyway. And I would just encourage people to, to read it themselves and read things that have been said about it. The one important thing that I, that I learned about it recently was, I think the survey was offered to like 750,000 students and only 150,000 took the survey, which is only about 90%. And they said in there, they said in the study that, that there might be uh, a bias in here because, or what they called a response bias, mm -hmm. meaning that people who have never been sexually assaulted may not even bother with the survey, but those who have been feel compelled to complete the survey because it was anonymous. So it could skew a little higher for that reason as well. Um, there, there's a lot, and there, there are videos breaking down and you can actually read the full study for yourself. And um, mm. it's interesting. Either way, it, it's it's somewhere between one in five women and one in 53 or 56 women, it's still too much, right? It's still, there's still a problem that either, either one in five, one in 56. I think that the, uh, the Bureau uh -huh. of Justice Statistics has it as one in 56 or one in 52.6 or something. I believe though the Bureau of Justice has that as like a, um, they're not looking at all the same things. And, and you know, like, again, and part of this is, um, in the States anyway, what constitutes rape is all over the board. Right. Like, um, there are states that will say that rape by fraud is, is rape. Yeah. And there are states that will not. Right? Yeah. So, like... What are your thoughts on that? I, I got into an interesting discussion with uh, about that on social media. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, the, the people that I know of who have been um, in the United States anyway, I know that there was a case in Tennessee. It actually seems very similar to the, um, if you know the, the movie Revenge of the Nerds, mm -hmm. it, there was somebody who was doing something like that, who he was um, 
uh, pretending to be someone's significant other, like sending them notes or, or calling, I can't remember exactly, and saying, you know, I have this fantasy where I come into the house and you're blindfolded and we make love and, and can we do this? And, you know, putting it with their name and the little flowers. And he got several women to, to agree to do that. And so he went to um, jail for rape by fraud. So I in that- should. I think he should, just so you know, my position on that, I think that is unequivocally rape. Yeah. I, I do. Uh, I've seen other cases where, not necessarily a case, a complaint uh, on social media of someone saying that, um, I think it was a it was a call, some sort of call in radio show, where this woman was like, I, this guy we had a we had a great date, and we had wonderful sex, and then he never called me back, and I just want to find him again. So they like she gave him the number or whatever, and they called the guy live on the radio, and he was just like. Oh yeah, no, your son used to bully me in high school and I just told him one day that I would screw his mom and I just got with you to get back at him. So tell your son he's still a, you know, whatever and hangs up the phone. And this whole discussion started happening online saying she was raped because he told her he was into her and he wasn't really into her. And that I don't, I wouldn't consider that rape. I would, you know, but the, what the other guy did blindfolding and sneaking into the house, pretending to be someone else, you know what I mean? So that yeah. it's, it's a little bit of a nuanced discussion because then you could go, what, what if a guy, you meet a guy at a bar and he tells you he's a doctor and then you have sex with him. And then later you find out he works at Subway. Did he rape you? You know, yeah. no, I don't, I don't think that that, that necessarily would fall into that. And I think that starts to minimize the actual problem of rape and real rape victims. Well, I'm not, um, I'm not really prepared. I, I've seen some interesting arguments both ways um, on that one. So I'm, I'm not like really prepared to have a final statement on that. Uh, but my point, larger point was that when you're talking about rape, the definition of it, especially in the United States, varies completely um, from state to state to state to state. And there's 50 of them. So like, so, and you would think that it wouldn't be that significant, but sometimes it really is, you know, and, and there are big gaping holes in some of the statutes and some of the laws, um, some of which haven't been looked at since Victorian times, really, in any significant way. So, you know, that's why we have a problem with child brides in certain Southern states. Right. Um, so, so, in, in the in the spirit of this discussion, and I know why people are tuning in to watch this, because I don't know the answer to this question. I'm not. It's not a gotcha. It's not a trap. I'm honestly just offering it for the discussion. Explain why you believe that a sexual assault allegation without evidence should be believed over other claims that are also presented without evidence. All right, I can do that. So when a person comes to you with a, a sexual assault claim, um, morally speaking, this is different than other claims. I think I, I mentioned this. Like, um, if I come to you and say, oh, I saw a ghost, you're, you, there's nothing morally upon you to do about that. You don't have to be like, Oh my God, there's a ghost. Well, who do we call? Like, what are we going to do about this? But if somebody has come to you and said, I was sexually assaulted, that's a whole different kettle of fish right there because now you've been alerted to a potential crime. You've been, um, somebody is coming to you needing your help. Another human being is there. And you should be, have humility to understand that you're not equipped really to evaluate whether or not this claim is accurate. Um, you don't have the training, you don't have the resources of the police. I'm assuming no one's uh, trained you in forensic experiential trauma interviews. I mean, most of us yeah. do not have that. Um, you don't know what the best practices would be. So you have to sort of make this, this decision. And of course, when people say, listen and believe, what they're talking about is um, 
is a heuristic, is sort of generally speaking, the best thing that you can do in the situation is to, and I, I disagree with the, the word believe only in as much as I would say, you can't necessarily tell, but you can't just tell yourself to believe something, right? right. right. Like, you can't to believe it. Yeah. But what you can do is be supportive and helpful to a person and give them the information that they would need, for instance, um, helping them to call a hotline like Rain, somebody who is um, helping them to get help, being there for them when, you know, um, and tr just trying not to fuck this up. And there's a couple of reasons why you should do this. Well, I think um, what you're talking about is more about compassion and being there for the victim, right? And mm -hmm. I, I'm, I don't know anybody who would disagree with that. And, and the people that you heard cheer at MythCon and even the people that everyone heard cheer at MythCon the previous year, individually, if someone came running to them and said, I was just raped or I was just sexually assaulted, they're not going to go, woo! They're not going to clap. They're not going to laugh. They're not going to cheer. They're going to say, are you okay? What happened? Who is it? Right? You say that, but the studies don't bear that out. I mean, even cops, even healthcare professionals, there've been a number of different studies on this. They do manage to, they manage to fuck this up. And it's a part of it is just because of the culture that we live in and the way that we treat women and the way that we think about women. I understand. So, I understand. I, I, what I'm getting at, though, is I think that what you're talking about, I certainly have no disagreement with. In that moment, when the person comes to you and says, I've been victimized, you're not going to sit down and make them take a polygraph. You're going to be there for that person as a humanist. And that I'm 100% on board with. I think all of that, we could probably save some time because I'm not going to disagree. We're, we're right there. Let's, mm -hmm. let's be there for people who come to us and say I was assaulted. I think the next step should be the police or some sort of formal complaint with authorities to have that person held accountable so they can do whatever testing they need to do. You file a police report because it's illegal to file a false police report. And if someone is willing to walk into a police station and file a report and say that person committed a crime against me, that's pretty damn believable, right? It's not perfect evidence, but it is evidence suggesting that person really believes that it happened. So that's a step in the right direction. Where I start to veer off is when people want to not necessarily take the judicial route, but they want to take the public shaming route. And they want to go to social media and name someone who is a public speaker or a politician or an actor and, and, and then start tweeting at his name and saying, this guy did this thing to me. And then people are getting their shows canceled, they're getting comedy tours shut down, they're getting, you know, cut from networks. Some of the people did it. Some of the people said, I, I thought it was consensual, and then she changed her mind, and now I don't have a job, and I'm a pariah. Where I start to back off is when they want to publicly name the person, especially when the alleged victim stays anonymous and can just name a celebrity and go, he, he touched me inappropriately. And now that person's career is ruined while this person gets to hide in the, in the shadows. If that person really did it, they deserve it. The thing is, we don't know. We just don't know if it really happened or to what the, extent. The problem is, and there's, there's a lot of problems, but the, the major problem is how we, as a culture that doesn't handle rape well, as a cu culture that hasn't been handling sexual assault well and treating it correctly, um, that's left a lot of people completely in the lurch. And this is the same for sexual harassment because sexual harassment and sexual assault can be, sometimes they're the same thing and sometimes they're different. And, and again, um, sexual harassment isn't a crime. So people can often be screwed as right. far as that goes. Um, and it's, it's not, it's not fair to put, um, to put the burden on women to suffer because there's no, there is not the same kind of recourse. I can't go, even if let's say somebody, you had a boss who demanded sex from you or in order to continue working and said it, and if you don't do this, you're never going to work in this town and I'm going to blackball you and I have that power. That's not assault. 
in a lot of cases and it's right. sexual harassment and it's right. not a crime sure it's a misuse of power that's terrible yeah right so so then you have those cases which um are incredibly you, difficult let me ask you this on the flip side of that how do you feel and this may get me in a little trouble with people but since we're talking about men really using their power i know you said someone it's almost always men doing that portion of it mm -hmm. say you have sex with me then then i'll give you this or this will happen for you how do you feel about women who attempt to do that in the in the reverse meaning intentionally seeking out those people of power having sex with them in order to get moved up in in that ladder Is well that I, just to you not just as bad no i mean it's it's not there a good thing to do but like they use sex to get what they want they're, they're using that man for sex in order to get some sort of financial gain or or more clout in their title like that's well a i man assume that he that both of them know what they're about like that's a consensual transaction it, like uh, that's how i'm reading what you're telling me is this does he does the person is he no, is this he another know. he I'm doesn't he know doesn't, I'm, saying, I'm saying the secretary is saying you look nice today you're very sexy you have pretty eyes you're very handsome and then eventually having sex with him and then she gets moved up the ladder and she never really liked him she's using sex to gain power where does that fall for you like well, that seems to be uh, similar to the examples that you gave in the sort of rape by fraud uh, thing, you know, where somebody lies about being a doctor or somebody um, lies because they're tricking somebody and they really just wanted to sleep with the mother of their bully or things like, like that seems to fall somewhere in there. And I think that there's an argument in there but i would be hesitant to call that the same the same kind of crime as what we're generally talking about like i think that you could like if i if we did something like that to steal each other's money like in some weird way if this was some sort of fraud to to con people out of money that's a crime um so the argument that i've heard it i'm trying to remember who it was because it was a very good um there was a legal guy who was also an atheist that i used to watch and i he hasn't been on youtube for like several years so i'm not remembering but he actually did a really good video on it and said so why do we consider what comes out of our pocketbook more of an issue than what than our own bodily autonomy and people tricking us and and how should the law and should the law even deal with that so i think that that is a question that i would really like to table <laughs> like because i don't i don't think that you and i are gonna um i don't even know what i think about that like i think that it could be some form of fraud but i would be hesitant to call it rape in the same way as as certain other things I think that in, in our culture too, and a lot of people I think miss this, is that when that kind of stuff happens to guys, <laughs> nobody cares. They just don't care. And I know that, that the idea is the other way around. Um, statistically, and I know from your arguments, that's, that's kind of the case, but I'm telling you, if, if I went to my friends and said, you know, because I'm a stand-up comedian, and if I went to my friends and said, man, this club owner, told me that if I had sex with her, I could headline on a Saturday night. Mm. You'd be like, so you're headlining, right? Like it's not going to be taken as though I was, I was used or taken advantage of. Oh, I know uh, it's rape culture against men is a very serious problem um, because of that, because of whenever you see um, a teacher who has uh, taken advantage of a young student who is and it's a female teacher to a young guy you get these these um uh terrible comments about oh lucky kid you know like that's really funny or something but no it's it's not a lucky kid that was a child who was taken advantage of and uh, that part of that the rape culture that we live in and part of the ideas that we're taught the sort of you know toxic ideas about gender are that men are always looking to get some and women are you know the other way around and 
and the there's these expectations and that's not the case people um everybody has an equal right to their own bodily autonomy and to nobody violating that without their consent that's a human right for or it should be for everybody so back on my 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 question to you about believing that over other things do you have right. like a reason as to why so like if if someone came to me and said um i talk to jesus on a regular basis and and he told me he told me that uh you're going to hell unless you give this church a thousand dollars and i go whatever I'm not, i don't believe that i don't think you have evidence for that claim i mean i talk with christians for a living over six and a half years that's all i've done on my show is debate preachers who make claims in my studio that they have no evidence for or that their evidence isn't sufficient for me to believe my atheist listeners listen to that and go, yeah, I would have rejected that too. We could say that about politicians. We can say that there's t politicians are always making baseless claims that, that we don't have, that, that, that we don't believe. What is it specifically about sexual assault? Now, when I asked you this a second ago, your answer went to being compassionate, being there for the person. And I totally agree hundred percent be there for that person. And then you said you didn't necessarily agree with the believe part of listen and believe because it doesn't matter at first. Be there for that person. If they're trembling, if they're upset, even if they did come to me and they ran in and said, I just saw a ghost. If they looked serious and were trembling, I wouldn't be like, bullshit. I would be like, are you okay? Because I'd be thinking there's something going on with them in some form or fashion, cool. a mental breakdown, or they had a vision, or they saw something, or they're on drugs. I don't know what's going on, but for some reason they believe this thing is real, I'm still going to be there for them. Even if they tell me they saw a ghost, I'm going to make sure they're okay first. Um, but you're right about the police thing. I wouldn't need to call the police on, on a ghost or, or the ghostbusters. I wouldn't, wouldn't care that much. Um, well, and there's, there's a about, huge difference. If you see, if you see someone tweet, for example, a woman tweets about Aziz Ansari or Louis CK and they make mm -hmm. the, they make the tweet and they mention the celebrity. What is it about that? that's any different from a Christian tweeting out, Jesus just came to me and said, you're all going to hell. What, Not all claims come to you with a, with uh, the same probability of being true. So to me, who has no, um, I've, I've never believed in, in Jesus and I've never believed in, in any of this, that sort of thing. Um, I, I, I would have to consider that an extraordinary claim that somebody saw Jesus and needed a thousand dollars from me. Uh, it's not an extraordinary claim. Um, so it, my, that somebody has been sexually assaulted and it is statistically very likely if somebody is telling you that, that they're telling you the truth, at least about the part of being sexually assaulted. It, false rape accusations are really rare and they are, more rare when they um, when it comes to actually people getting in jail for it. I mean, we're just we're in a situation here where there are rape kits that just sit moldering on shelves by the thousands and thousands. And when they do test them, they often find that there's some something like thirty or forty percent of them are um, repeat offenders. So people are coming in, they're not, they're not even getting that test done. And when they do do it, they find out uh, here's, there was a serial rapist going around. Cause basically, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous to, to think really, this would be extraordinary to me that there were just a bunch of women who every time this one guy had sex with them oh, thought yeah, they no. were raped. Yeah. No, no, let me, let me just be clear about this. I, I know that the vast majority of rape allegations are true. Mm -hmm. and my, I, issue is, my issue is the percentage i mean you're still there's still what 300 something million people in the country and thousands of claims made every year right hundreds of thousands that means there are tens of thousands of men who are falsely accused and so if the person just comes and says i was assaulted like i did i'm not naming the person I don't want any effect. I'm not trying to have him fired from his job. Um, I'm not, I'm not going after him for it. But if, if I were to name that person, 
and say, I want him to lose his job or lose his spot on some board of directors. The work letter. Do you think I should not have, I should not be required to provide evidence for that? Or because I, I, I basically, well, me, I, um, I, I hear you talking a lot about being compassionate and being there for the person. I don't hear you talking about, I'm sorry. I don't hear you talking about the behaviors. And that's really, I think where I back, back off and go, no, in private, you and I can talk about this and I can be there for you. But I've had people email me and say, I need you to publicly denounce this person. And they'll give me a name and I'll go, I don't know what happened in this situation. And you want me to get on my social media feed to my followers and, and damn this person when I've, I, I haven't been trained for this. I don't know what evidence has been out there. And they're saying, you're a rape apologist, hashtag believe all women. And I'm going, I can't. I can't just accept a claim without evidence and then go ruin someone's career. If you come to me privately and say, I did this, I can be there for you. But when you expect action out of me, you want me to boycott someone. You want me to attack someone on social media. I'm not going to do that without evidence. I'm just not. And I think that makes me a good skeptic, but a lot of people call me a rape apologist for that. Well, I think if you don't feel comfortable and you feel like you need to abstain, then I would ab abstain. Uh, the problem I'm trying to, to get across to you here is that women have had no recourse for a long time. They've had no reasonable way to get any kind of justice or even protection for themselves and for other women. So that's what Me Too and Time's Up is about. When you see something like Kavanaugh, um, women would love to process. If that was available widespread, if like you really actually got that, if if the FBI had actually done an investigation, if that had been taken seriously, you know, done a real one, not like three days and four people, like it, but women would love more due process, due process for us as well, due process for the victims you know, process those rape kits, listen to people's testimony, ask questions. Instead, it gets pushed under the rug, it, rug, it gets pushed away. Oh, and yeah. I, I, it's gotten to a point, it has just gotten to a point where it's just like, no more. So I think what we have to do is find, um, you know, I would encourage you, for instance, there is, um, and I'm not sure where this bill is now, but uh, for instance, a lot of times when you get, when you sign up for a job, um, you basically sign up to say that if something happens like sexual harassment, it has to be handled in house and you are um, under. Talk about arbitration clauses. Right, arbitration clauses. And that those come with, um, women being silenced. So that's one of the things that women are doing because that that comes up with similar well, to to other places when you have people in power that can silence you and there's nothing you can do about that, you're screwed. And yet these people are going to move on and, and you'll see people, like how many times did somebody like um, the Fox News guys just pay people out stupid amounts of money and keep doing it? And, uh, you know, how many, like somebody like Weinstein who could afford to get people from fucking um, Mossad to, to chase women around and, and screw with people's livelihoods and their careers. Like this is, this has hurt so many women's careers, their lives, their realities. Like as, as much as I appreciate that a false accusation um, can can harm you and can do real damage to a person and that's not right um, the fact that we're constantly so worried about that and so not worried about all these women and what's happened to their careers and what's happened to their because we're not worried about that that to me is a that's a, that's a false equivocation fallacy chrissy I, I i can be worried about both yeah i and uh, i I am. And, and you mentioned there's no recourse and that's terrible. I think there should be more. Uh, I think we should take those claims seriously. We should investigate those claims. There should be due process. I agree with everything you said, but there's, there should also be 
what are where are where's the recourse for say Aziz Ansari with his story where he had a girl over they have a different opinion of what happened that night he called her an uber she went home yes he tried to get her to have sex with him a few times she said maybe later and then it was over it's it's a, it's detailed in a story and then he's an outcast for four months is banned from comedy clubs can't go do stand up they're not going to put his netflix special on for what 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 what's his recourse for this a slander lawsuit yeah good luck proving that i mean it's well it doesn't it, like it really doesn't seem to me like um that was a uh, something that was likely and i i don't believe that he's ever said that she exactly lied i think that this was a case and she's very clear like it, it wasn't like she accused him of rape she talked about the situation and what happened and how like how it affected her and look he's if you put out a book called modern romance and and position yourself as a, a romantic guru i think you you open yourself up to a woman saying this not only is this guy not a romantic guru who you should not listen to but he's kind of a bully in the when you get on with him are we talking and about the comedian? a season sorry yeah i didn't know about his book yeah he he wrote a book called um modern romance or modern uh, how to how to be a modern romantic or something and i think that's um a part of why this this came out and why it was looked at the way it was because he had presented um so, himself in a certain way so so if so you personally if mm -hmm. if someone tweeted um about a celebrity that you didn't know personally like let's say they just picked a random i don't want to say anybody's name but let's just say they picked a, a random celebrity and said this guy sexually assaulted me in college would you retweet that would you signal boost that uh i might i might not it would really depend like i generally do believe women and i generally do um like i i have said over and over again i believe dr ford and I mean, I believe her. Not, I'm not pretending I believe her, but somehow I think that she doesn't know what she's actually happened or something. I believe her. I found her incredibly credible. Um, you know, if it was somebody that I'd never heard of, had no idea of anything about, um, similar to what you were talking about, I probably would step back from that. I wouldn't do anything either way. But I, you know, once I got more information, I would make my own judgment. And yeah, I think that men have to be held to account. I think when men start getting held to account that they might actually put real rules in place and so that they're not, this isn't done in this terrible ad hoc way of, of people, like if this is the only recourse that women are getting, that, that that's what they're gonna take. And it's that's what it is because women should not have to tolerate all this abuse and harassment and assault forever because nobody wants to get their shit together. And it's not like we haven't been talking, you know, and it, it's not like we haven't been seeking these things. It's just, uh, they've been falling on deaf ears for so long because of uh, the toxic uh, misogyny in some places and in some places, terrible rape cultures. The Catholic church is, a horrible rape culture right now many of the uh, christian churches are the same way in this country um prison, prison is as well prison me. prison is a horrible horrible mm -hmm. like it, to the point where it's just almost a joke that people tell mm -hmm. which is disgusting so it's like also there are certain sports um sports clubs and things so it's like you get in these places where um where people have power over other people and it gets abused and then nobody does anything about it and it goes nowhere so from your answer it kind of sounds like um you probably would signal boost something like that like i don't know if you saw like things that happened to me but I, I get the feeling, and correct me if I'm wrong, I get the feeling that had you seen a tweet 
with screenshots of someone saying something nasty about me before you and I talked. And then say Christy Winters retweets this and says, don't financially support David Smalley. He's a sexual predator. Something like that in our own like atheist realm, would you retweet stuff like that? I get the feeling that you probably would because you would believe women. You would just believe that this person's telling the truth. Um, I'll say that I might, especially if a lot of people that I respected were already signal boosting it. You know, okay. if great point. that's a great point. Why? Why is it that? Because they can't have any more evidence than you have. Mm hmm. Right. They don't know the person. And even if they know the person, they weren't there in that situation. So why would you as a skeptical person signal boost something that can potentially really hurt somebody, me? Why signal boost that when you don't know for sure if you have the evidence to back it up? I don't know for sure. Um, and, and I don't want to use you as an ex as an example because I don't like even as you say, people sent me screenshots of things and you sent me screenshots of things. And my answer was that I was agnostic. So I think uh, the answer to that is, is that we're even talking. Like if I re if I thought that um, there was a significant chance that you're a sexual harasser who's here just to uh, polish his, his credibility with a feminist, I would have nothing to do with it. Like I would have shut you down hard. Um, so, so I don't, that's what I would have to say about that. I think I'm agnostic enough at this point, lacking somebody coming up with something else, some corroboration, somebody, you know, doing something um, that I'm just not going to touch it. I let you, I let you talk. I let you tell your side of the story. And I only kind of stopped you when you started to say, and this is what really happened. And there was this woman and she said this, and it was like, well, we're not going to go there, but that was, uh, so I don't think it's fair to say that I have no standards whatsoever uh, for people or that I just retweet anything, but I, um, I know that it is, a secondary trauma to survivors not to be believed that it increases their PTSD. I know that the people who come and, and say they've been um, attacked or hurt have a far greater chance of telling the truth than not. And I know, so there are no guarantees in life, but when you have to do some kind of cost benefit risk reality analysis, in, in this world, in this world that neither of us start, you know, made the rules for, and we're both trying to manage as well as we can. I, I know that we're, we can only do the best we can. And unfortunately right now with the situation right now, sometimes that means uh, taking people and believing them and, and knowing. Um, I, could, I should show you, hang on. I think believing someone for the sake of being supportive for that individual is important. But well, I then, definitely, I definitely don't. Act on that in public and potentially harm someone else's reputation, to me, that requires additional evidence. That's what I'm getting at. Before anyone goes to jail, before they lose their job, before any of these things happen, I, I just think more evidence should be required. I, I, and, and I don't, I don't know how so many people in the atheist community look at me and then call me a rape apologist or a misogynist for asking for evidence before we ruin someone's career. I just, I, I don't, I literally cannot comprehend how that's, how that's anti-woman because I can, I can be I can be there for you when you say this happened to me, but when step two is requested for me to go actually try to fire someone or ruin someone's career or email someone's company and have their show canceled, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that without evidence. I'm just not, I'm not going to signal boost something I don't have proof of. Mm. Well, and again, when people come and, and they're, 
asking for a signal boost. They're not putting anyone in jail. You know, I mean, it is harm that can be done, but it's harm either way. Like, it's also harmful for a person to be allowed to stay in power who has been hurting people. And right. we've Here's seen over and over again how often these things turn out to be true. Like, hashtag believe victims. I agree with that. But determine who the victim is first. Because the victim could be the guy with a false accusation. The victim could be the woman. That's where I, I'm, I'm before the believing. I'm, I'm for it. But let's make sure the person's an actual victim and then move forward with the support. And I think I, let me, let me, I'm going to share a little bit of a unique perspective on, on this. Well, before you go that, I want to, I want to show you something and I'm going to screen share okay. um, so that people can see it. So hang on. I'm going to make a note here so I don't forget my. Uh, my okay, go ahead. All right. So. I was looking at um, the best, so this is Police Chief IACP magazine, and it was talking about um, sexual harassment, sexual assault, Me Too, uh, and you know one of the things that they they say over and over again is that. Um, there's no neutrality. There's only a greater or lesser awareness of one's bias. Um, and gender bias is a factor. So they're, they try to ram this home. And what they're talking about here, um, let's see, this is a, uh, by the way, the uh, prosecutor and a police officer, both who have a lot of experience talking about that. Um, mm, Let's see, it talks about credibility. All right. So the victim's credibility, this is what they say, can be broken down into four components. One is the actual credibility, uh, which by which they mean um, their behavior and their, do they have a motive, you know, things that come on, um, come up as far as that. The victim's ability to perceive events at the time of the incident, the victim's ability to remember what happened, and the existence of corroborative evidence. In order to evaluate the victim's credibility, the prosecutor and ultimately the jurors need context and supporting facts, including medical evidence, witnesses, physical evidence, and in some cases, um, expert testimony that explains behavior that is counterintuitive to ex expectations. A circle of credibility begins with believing rather than attacking the victim's statement. The second circle, examines the witness statements, um, suspect statements. The third circle consists of physical evidence. And this is, of course, when you're talking about a crime, right? So what they say, though, is instead of jumping on the victim's credibility as the starting place for a charging decision, inform trained prosecutors, build a circle of credibility within, which to fairly evaluate the merits of a case and make a better charging decision. It's nearly impossible for human beings to avoid drawing on stereotypes and attitudes towards individuals and groups that can and do result in real world discrimination. So I think that, I think our whole culture is involved in a learning experience about how this is, um, how this is handled and how this is dealt with it like this is when you're talking about crime most of the time signal boosting a tweet you know or seeking that people who have been credibly accused of something are no longer put in in uh powerful places where they can continue to harm people right like that's a whole different situation than like, putting I, someone I can, in jail. Look, I'm straight. I, I could right now during this video, I could grab my phone. I could tweet a random celebrity. I could pick somebody like Joe Rogan and I could just tweet at him one time and say that he raped me or did something to me 
when I was at a, I went to a college comedy show and but I could completely you make could but but just and who does that like that, maybe I'm somebody does it once in a great while but I'm saying if I did that though that would be on CNN they would take a picture of him from the internet put it on CNN it would be a uh, famous podcaster, actor, and UFC commentator accused of this. And th and it would just be the court of public opinion would just attack him. And then, and then you know, we could go to court and fight it well, off. Well, there's a similar thing happened to, uh, what was his name? That guy from um, uh, Star Trek. What is his name? Oh, my God. George, uh, uh, right, Takai. Takai, right? So uh, that that's what happened to him. He had a random person and like nothing happened because nobody came forward to sort of back him up and there wasn't and he was credible and then it just nothing happened. Like we're seeing right now that a a guy that I believe absolutely is a rapist is about to be put on the Supreme Court. Um I've no doubt of that personally after I, I've seen too much of, of these kinds of people and I, I know the sort of gaslighting abuser sign and I found um, I found uh, Dr. Ford incredibly credible as I've said and so where's his <laughs> like they're not even going to check. They're not even going to investigate. Like people, it takes something to actually knock people off of their power base. And most of them are trying to come back, you know, and I don't think that in a lot of cases that's acceptable to me that, you know, people feel like without having done the soul searching, but I, at, at I, some I, point people can come back. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know? Chris, we're not disagreeing we're i think your your viewers are going to say we're talking past each other i think that mm. you are you are talking about something that i agree with and i think i'm talking about something that you agree with and we just have different focuses because we have different perspectives you have a different experience i have a different experience um I, uh, you may be a victim i may be a victim but i'm also a victim of false accusations and i don't believe you've ever been accused of something you didn't do publicly and had your career hurt because of it or your finances or your ability to support children um, hurt because of it. So I think we have different experiences as we should as two different human beings, but I don't think we, we totally disagree in this. I think assuming that the person did the thing, I agree that power should be removed. The scary thing is when power is taken away and we don't know if they did it or not. And it just becomes a, there becomes this this black or white issue of either you're tweeting hashtag believe all women and as many anti things about this person as you can. And if at any point you go, um, I don't know that I have enough evidence for that. You're called a rape apologist and now you're called a rapist. As a matter of fact, that happened. I forgot the comedian's name, but he he tweets at some point. Rape apologist equals rapist. Nazi apologist equals Nazi. And so 36 hours later, I'm now a Nazi and a rapist. And I'm just going, what is happening to our skeptical community when you go from, you know, just one accusation on Facebook and then someone saying it was an inappropriate request, which at best could be considered sexual harassment if it did happen, and then turns into sexual assault because of the telephone game. And then sexual assault turns into rape. Next thing you know, the person's a rapist. This even happened when you and I were talking the first time in that room. You mm -hmm. had mentioned, I asked if you knew about a, uh, how much you know about me because I didn't know, because I had said on my show before that I had been molested as a child and I didn't know if you knew that. So I said, how much do you know about me? You said, I know you did a video with Sargon. And I was like, why is that an issue? And then you pushed back that, well, he tweeted at her and she's a victim of rape. And I, at Jess Phillips, she was raped. And I was like, I don't want to diminish what happened to her, but it wasn't mm -hmm. rape. She a man grabbed her and kissed her in a bar and tried to put his hand up her skirt. She pushed him away and reported it. And the bartender was like, I didn't see it happen. I'm not just going to throw somebody out because you pointed at him. She All right. I think in this case, point there's is, my point is though, that this idea that someone was inappropriately touched can blow up into sexual assault and then it becomes rape. And next thing you know, it's hashtag kill your local rapist. And these people who had maybe 
either been falsely accused or had acted inappropriately or did something that they shouldn't have done are now lumped in with people who are literally breaking into homes and violently raping women. And I just feel like there needs to be nuance here. We need to be able to have the conversation and talk about it and not just draw a line in the sand and say either hashtag believe all women or you're cheering for rape because I'm not in either of those categories. Mm. I think you also have to think about, and, and I understand that with the, um, with the the situation in your um, at MythCon, that that just was the first thing that came into your mind. Um, right. But I, I do think also you have to be cognizant about the history in the skeptic and atheist community and the kinds of things that are going on about that. You know, part of this is intentionally building a culture which doesn't hurt its members you know when you're talking about atheism and you're talking about people coming from in some cases the most awful oppressive conditions you know because they've been deconverted they may have lost their families over it they may have lost everything these people might have been raised to believe that because they're gay or because they're women that they're nothing or they're worse than nothing there's something terribly wrong with them um, and so they they come to the atheist community and they get more of the same. <laughs> like, it's not good there. So many it's people. It's not the same. I think that's... Uh, a, I think well, that's it's not the same, but it's the, the it feels of- like the same to many, many people. And I know that because I've heard so many people tell me that. Like, this, I left religion. What did I leave it for? Like if it was just going to be like this. Well, here's the thing. Uh, Atheism is really, really white and really, really male. That I get. Mm -hmm. Um, It was America, right? It's just, that's our demographic. It's, it's, it's a, it's super white. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I get that. I'm not going to stop talking about atheism because I'm a white male and there's a lot of us. I'm still going to want to go to conferences and and have my time on stage. I'm not going to be told to shut up because of the color of my skin. I think I should still have a seat at the table, but I think we should also do what we can to to diversify the worldview. That's important too. Fundamentalists, Baptists, Christians, Catholics, whatever, they have doctrine that teaches them to treat women differently and to treat gays differently. And some even use that to treat treat people of color differently. Mm-hmm. Atheists don't have that doctrine. So if there's any of that in our community, it should definitely be far less because that Christian or that religious culture has infiltrated our minds. It's the same way with sex shaming. There are atheists who leave behind this idea that you know, sex is inappropriate, or if you look at a woman and have sexual thoughts, you should gouge out your eye. We're raised with this. We become atheists, but it's hard to let some of that stuff go. You still think uh, you shouldn't go outside in that little short skirt. That's wrong because why is it wrong? I know it's wrong, but why is it wrong? And then we be- we become more sex positive the more we let that stuff go. Dr. Daryl Ray is phenomenal at teaching that. He has a podcast called Secular Sexuality. He's written books about it, Sex mm-hmm. and God. Um, it's, it's very much about how, even though you're atheist, you let some of that stuff go. I personally, and this is just anecdotal. I, I was, when I was the editor of the American atheist magazine, I put, um, uh, there was a, there was a, that was around the prop eight time in California. And there was a guy, a comedian, Keith Lowe Jensen was doing, uh, he was handcuffing couples together on the, on the state Capitol and saying, we're not going to legalize gay marriage because we're protect or because we're protecting marriage. So no one can ever get divorced. And in this protest, he was handcuffing people together and then doing a, a wedding ceremony, a fake wedding ceremony. I put that as the cover of the American atheist magazine, because he was an atheist and he was doing all this activism mm-hmm. you know, in favor of gay marriage. And we had probably 5,000 people subscribed to the magazine. And I heard from one guy who was very anti-gay. He wrote in saying, um, I didn't sign up for a faggot magazine. I signed up for an atheist magazine. And I was just like, did this really just come from an atheist? Who's, I wrote him back. I'm like, I'm very disappointed that, that what's your basis? I'm very disappointed that you would write me and say that. And he was so vitriolic. 
it stood out to me. It was shocking to me that that would exist in our community, but it was one guy out of our 5,000 subscribers. And so I look at that and I go, what reason would atheists have to be negative to women? What There may be some, I'm not saying they don't exist, but there is no way it is the same as in the fundamentalist Christian community where there are specific doctrines saying women can't speak in church, women can't hold these certain positions. There is no atheist doctrine. There is no rules we have to follow. There is no no guideline or something that says women can't play a certain role. So it's, it's going to be better. I think that you should also understand, though, that for a person who has come out of religion and they saw um, last year the Sargon debate, that was crushing, you know, when there was that cheering. It was crushing, right? I disagreement. I think the cheering I, had valid. I don't care what the cheering had to do with. Like, that's what I'm trying to get you to, to see that you can't well, just, right. because uh, regardless, you, you and I do think differently. But I know that I've been abused by verbally um emotionally by so many atheists you know do you want to know have, the number one um feedback you. that i have gotten for, since mythcon and and i do appreciate that you uh, you were very gracious on stage and i think that set the tone and that was helpful for the people who were there but as soon as i left i had you know these huge atheist youtubers um, tweeting out how fat I was, and and that was that has become the number one thing that people have said about me is that I'm fat, like, and it's it's not cool, but I, that's I, I, very I've, typical. I've gotten the more abuse, more online verbal abuse for me has come from atheists than from Christians. Mm. I've had early on, I had every not once every three months, someone would I would get a death threat or. You know, I'm going to kill you so we can both go to hell, but at least I'll save thousands of Christian souls that you're trying to deconvert. I mean, just terrible things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But those have been few and far between. I sent you screenshots. All of those people are atheists. Yeah. Almost. I and mean, there's one of them that's a, that's a believer. It's awful. But they've been people who, who when, whenever, when, when, when he read the tweet, I wouldn't even rape you, and then people cheered. And there was this big divide immediately. People were going, I can't believe they would cheer for rape. And I went, I don't think they cheered for rape. I think they were cheering defiance. There's a whole thing with that story of like uh, Thomas doing all of this buildup before and weaponizing shame and then him free speech. It was a free speech defiance thing. I, don't, I think I, that I, I, you I don't, don't understand just how misogynist Sargon is. Like what you're talking to me here is it feels like um, – uh, what is it that uh, Harris likes to say? It's a distinction without a difference. If you're a huge Sargon fan, you're okay with misogyny. You're more than okay with it. That's not true. That is I, I so I true. I don't buy that at all. I think that Sargon. I have followed person. this man. He got his start his, in Gamergate. I know. I know. He I know. has I know. been his, such a vicious his, misogynist. I'm not his defense attorney. Okay. I, I know him. Uh, we've done, I think, one video together, and I hung out with him a little bit at MythCon this year. Um, I see he gets falsely accused of stuff sometimes. I walked up and showed him. I was like, hey, did you know that you're a pedophile? And he goes, what? And I showed him the tweet, and he got actually upset. And he was like, he was like that is the opposite of what I said. Why would they say that about me? And it bothered him, and, and I, I, just, I was like, I was just trying to joke with you. Like, it's not a big deal. I didn't think you would care. And... Um, I'm not his defense attorney. I haven't watched every one of his videos. He says stuff that I wouldn't say to me, Sargon. I think that is such a cop out. He says uh, stuff that you wouldn't say because why? Why wouldn't you say it? What's wrong think, with it? I think Sargon um, is the YouTube version of like a shock jock. I think he will go over the top to prove a point. And I say over the top because I will get to the top, but I won't cross those lines to prove the point. And he is willing to. He's willing to cross those lines to prove points, and I, I yeah, he's willing to to laugh at my friend the day after her the day of her death, and and laugh when people say, "Well, there's a feminist that got triggered for the last time when they shot oh, her to death." That's terrible. Yeah, I've never heard of that. I was not aware of that story. I mean, um, I could I could show you because I've 
Okay, that's fine. I just, I, I'm, my point is, I'm not defending him. I'm not, I'm not anti Sargon. I'm not, uh, I'm not his defense attorney. I will, I mean, I guess I can, I am defending him because I, I think it's, it's misunderstood. But we were talking about the cheer. And I think I wouldn't even rape you. But I, I just, uh, and, and again, I didn't even make a distinct statement. I wasn't even, nothing I said was anti woman. All I said was, I don't know that there's evidence that they cheered for rape. I think they were cheering defiance. It was my opinion. And the defiance of a misogynist man <laughs> who said a terrible thing to a sex, to a rape victim or a, a sexual assault victim. Again, she's not a rape victim. I was immediately called a rape apologist for simply saying to me, it came across for having an interpretation of an event. To me, it came across as they were cheering for defiance. I don't get that they were cheering for rape. I don't know that anyone would do would cheer rape. I think that's a misunderstanding. Can Who we not have an interpretation of that without me being called names? Well, I hope I haven't called you any names. Not you. The the people that were listening at the time, they completely attacked me for it, and I was called a rape apologist. Now I'm I'm suddenly okay with rape. That's how black and white our skeptic community has become. I am now in favor of rape because I said. To me, it appeared that they were cheering for defiance. Now I hate women. Come, well, that's not criticism. It's just not. I, I don't, I would like you to be able to put some of that aside and to be able to listen to, to women say, it's our atheist movement too. I get that. You know, it's women's atheist movement, too. It's gay atheist movement, too. And we can't, um, we can't prioritize, constantly prioritize the comfort of, of white men. Like, if, if you see women being hurt by this culture, and they are, like, there is absolutely no doubt that this culture, and it is, there's different things that have happened and different reasons that this has happened. You know, I think the YouTube community um, with its, uh, its need for drama and its need for clickbait and it's uh, turning into sort of a finance, there's a financial benefit um, to this sort of right wing stuff. Like that's one yeah. things. Would it be possible? Cause I do want to talk to you about that. Would, do you, is it possible to take a short break at all? Or do you just yeah, no, I, I mean, it's, you know what, we've been going quite a long time. <laughs> um, uh, so maybe, maybe we can um, <laughs> schedule a different time to, to talk oh, okay. about just, that. Like, quick 30 seconds and then come right back. I was going to grab some more water and, and just. All right, go, water. go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I'm fine with that. If you're fine with stepping out for like 30, 40 seconds. Yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll just talk to the audience. Go for it. Tell them all my dirty secrets. I don't know any of your dirty secrets. I really don't want to. Make some up. It's the internet. Who cares? I'll be right back. <sighs> so, hi, chat. How's it going? <laughs> uh, don't say atheism plus. Don't say atheism plus. I know. I'll scare them all. It's terrifying. Um. Yeah. Oh, Larry, you came by. Hi, Larry. <laughs> you weren't going to come. Uh, it's a good conversation. That's that's good. <laughs> uh, If I could summarize David's position in 60 seconds, how would I do it? Um, I think that David, uh, and this is where I'm, I'm, the difference between him and me is I think he puts a lot more equal, uh, equal weight on uh, people coming forward and people um, saying that they believe that they've been falsely accused. And I don't put equal weight on those because I don't think it's appropriate to do that. So that's, I guess, the, the quick 
it's not so much his opinion as how our opinions differ. Hi, Nectar Vam. I have no problems with theists. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, I don't know if it was it um, the AAUs. Was it Sargon's video you think he watched or? I'm back. Hey, so the one thing in the um, the chat is uh, w that would they would like to know from you is um, about Kavanaugh. Yeah. So, what is your opinion? Do you think he should be placed on the Supreme Court? Absolutely not. Absolutely okay. not. Um, I think he's. I mean, I, I've anyone. I encourage you to go. Uh, you don't have to follow me. I'm not begging for followers here, but go to my Twitter at David C Smalley. I've been um, tweeting about this um, incessantly. My most recent one was, regardless of where you are on the political spectrum and whether or not you believe the sexual allegations against Kavanaugh, you must admit that his childlike temperament during that hearing at least means there is someone else better suited for the highest court in our nation. Mm -hmm. um, there's that. There's, there's all sorts of things that I've, that I've tweeted about him. I think uh, uh, I've, I'm friends with... Um, well, I won't, well, yeah, I'm friends with uh, Andrew Seidel of FFRF, and um, he, I, I, you know, he, he retweeted my thing just the other day about all the all the anti uh, atheist stuff, anti woman. Uh, Kavanaugh's very much about controlling the decisions of women. I think he's a terrible choice for this. I, I, I think, I think it's awful. I think, mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not they can prove the 36 year old uh, allegations, um. I think he's not the best guy for the job. Now, personally, do I believe Dr. Ford? I do. I happen to think she's telling the truth, but I don't think we should base our decision off of who, who's on the Supreme Court based off of the allegation. I think there are tons of other reasons that we have actual hard physical empirical evidence for that he shouldn't be on the court. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my take on it. And I, I think the FBI investigation was horrific there were like nine people willing to come forward and they talked with three or four of them mm. um this whole thing's just been rushed through it's been it's made a mockery of our of our political system and it's just it's just insane but no i'm not a fan of kavanaugh i think he's awful i think he uh behaved like a child and uh me and uh jeremy uh, from uh the quartering mm. oh we yeah were, we were getting into it over twitter today it was kind of fun about that uh we were actually disagreeing about that that piece of it i think he is pro kavanaugh and i'm definitely anti so um yeah it doesn't surprise me that he's pro kavanaugh um so uh, the other the other uh, i'm not going to get started on jeremy um the other question that i'm getting is people uh, you talked about the aau study they were wondering if if you had um gotten any of your information from sargon's video on that Oh, no, I didn't know he did a video on that. No, no, okay. no. I specifically looked up feminist uh, viewpoints and and feminist studies on it. Um, I did find one from the factual feminist, who I know a lot of feminists don't like. Um, and I went after I found the study and I saw it referenced three different times in three different videos. Um, I did go find it for myself and read to see if what they said was actually in it was in it. And I was able to confirm it. That's the way I do it before I come on air and say anything. So I, okay. I did. All right. So that was, those were the questions. So okay. um, now uh, if you want to, I can't yeah. remember where we were at. I, I, I remember the note that I made before, before I stepped out. Um, I have, I have a unique take on this and this is, you know, I'm, I'm glad we're, we've been able to open this up and talk about these different things. I think this may be a little bit of a unique perspective and I don't know how often. And again, I feel like as I'm listening to our conversation, I, part of what we're missing each other on is you are very much more about the broad scope of women in general and percentages and statistics. Mm -hmm. And I keep talking about the individualist approach. I'm saying, but what if that guy gets wrongly accused and you're like, yeah, but there's so many women who get accused and not believed. And both are true, right? Both, both, both could be, could be an issue. I don't, I don't understand. Cause like individualistically, what if that 
lady gets sexually harassed and nobody believes her. You like like to me, um, the no, the I, the numbers thing just mean there's more individuals there. What anytime I've mentioned that though, you tend to go toward the bigger numbers. Yeah, but there's more women not believed, or that's really rare. I go, yeah, yeah, I know it's rare, but if it happens to you, it doesn't feel rare. It feels like 100% of your life takes a left turn when you weren't expecting it because you were blindsided with a false accusation. When that happens, you're not going to give a damn about, oh, you're only 8% of the population. It doesn't matter. That's literally hundreds of thousands of people, and it sucks to be in this position. So I say all that to say this. There, there, there's something else that's happened to me that I've never talked about publicly. So Christiosity exclusive. Okay. I've had women hit on me who worked for me, came on to me sexually. I turned them down and then felt like I couldn't talk about it. Now, why? Well, this idea, this, this culture that you're talking about, who, who is going to believe I look like this <laughs> and an attractive woman hits on me and I say no? If I were to come out publicly and say this person came on to me sexually and sent me uh, messages or tried to say things into my ear and tried to get me to do things with her and I told her no, or I was at a convention and a woman who I know is married and not in an open relationship asked me multiple times to come to her hotel room and I told her no repeatedly. If I as a man were to come out and say this against a woman, I know what's going to happen. At least I fear what would happen. I would not be believed and I would probably end up being accused of the opposite. Because if I come out as a guy and go, she requested sexual things of me and I say no, people aren't, aren't going to believe that. Like you said, this idea that guys are always looking for it mm. right, and women want it. So that narrative would not be believed. That's happened on two separate occasions people who worked for me and it's happened another time, someone who didn't work for me at all, but I knew was married and tried to get me to do things at a convention. All three times I said no. And here's the crazy part. When this stuff came out about me, this, this, this story surfaced or whatever that Christy Winter started spreading around. I saw one of the women who had come on to me that I rejected went and commented on something and was like, yeah, I'm not surprised. And I was floored that this person who I had rejected was lending credence to a false allegation against me. And that for me, that confirmed why I never told anybody that these women had come on to me because they're not going to believe a guy turned it down. And then it might go, wait a minute, why would he do that? Let's look into him. And then I become the focus. And then any false out accusation that wants to get thrown out is going to be believed. So I'm curious if you've ever given any thought to men being approached, rejecting women, and then afraid to tell somebody that that happened because they don't want to be accused of being the, the predator. Well, I've, uh, I know that there have been, um, men have brought sexual harassment cases against women. Um, and I don't know what the, uh, you know, I, I can't remember if I even know what ended up happening. I think they got some money for it because so, you know, obviously it's, it's not right. If people are, women are sexually harassing men. Um, I agree with you. I do agree that there is some real bias on this issue. I is agree that if I'm, in, if I'm the one that's in power, like let's say it's my receptionist and she comes to me and says she wants to do things with me and I say that would be inappropriate. I don't want to do that. Is that sexual harassment? I don't even know if that qualifies because she's not in a position of power. I'm not a, I'd have to look up the rules, but <laughs> of sexual harassment, I think it's certainly inappropriate. I think that, um, and should you say, I'm sorry, but no, I, I just, that's not something I want. And if, if this was something where they continued um, to pester you for sex, I would consider that harassing. 
myself. Yeah. So I don't, I, I think once I, I, a person says no, that should be respected. You and, know? and I think some people may, oh, this is his white male fragility and oh, he's so sensitive. And that's not the case at all. I'm really saying this to say that I really can connect both as an adult who was propositioned and said no and as a child who was molested and was ashamed to tell anybody on both levels i can really connect with someone who was sexually assaulted or I, i'm not going to say raped because i can't but sexually assaulted and afraid to tell people because they don't they think they're not going to be believed mm. I, i'm I think I understand more than you think I understand. I, I get that. I've been there both as an adult and as a child. Um, and even though I've experienced that in both ways, I think I can, I can believe you. I can be there for you. I can support you. But asking me to go to the next level and publicly out someone, which has happened multiple times. Anytime something like this comes out or someone gets accused of something in our community, I'm one of the first people I think that people come to because of my platform within the atheist community. They come mm. to me and go, got to you got to put this on your show. You got to tell you got to go out this guy on dogma debate. You got to say his name. You got to distance yourself. And in that moment, I know what's happening. It's black or white. I either run with it get in this microphone and tell the world something I don't know for sure is true. Or well, I tell the person privately, I tell the person privately, I don't have enough evidence to try to ruin this man's career. And then they go out and publicly shame me and call me a rape apologist because I wouldn't out someone. And so I end up in the situation of, do I want to be a liar or an asshole? So, all right. So uh, what about Lawrence Krauss then? I mean, there's been a, I think, significant number of people have come out. He was uh, investigated by his university um, and they found that it was credible. So at this point, like if Lawrence Krauss wanted to come on your show, what would you say? Um, I think it would depend on what he wanted to talk about if he wanted to come on and address that and be willing to answer to the investigation and answer to some of the challenges and let me pose them as a journalist, I think that's good dialogue. If he called and said, David, I want to come on and talk about my new book. Please don't ask me anything about the sexual whatever. I would probably have to decline that because I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be being honest to myself um, and my own work for my show. Um, in fact, when all of that broke, I reached out and said, I don't know what's going on. I read the investigation. Do you want to come on my show and talk about it? You can give your side of the story as long as you're okay with being challenged. The exact same thing I say to Christians who want to come on my show, I'll give you my platform to say your piece as long as you're okay with being respectfully challenged. And those who say, I don't want to be challenged, don't get to come on the show. Um, Lawrence is a little bit of a unique situation with me because I, I do know him personally and he was at my home for a couple of days and um, there is a, a children's book that I published in which he wrote the foreword for. He did it for free. He wanted no royalties. Um, he, he wrote the foreword for one of our tiny thinkers science books and um Immediately when the story came out, the distributor emailed me and said, you have to immediately denounce Lawrence Krauss. And I just went, I, can we wait until the investigation? I heard there's going to be one. And they were like, denounce him now. And I just went, I, not yet. I'm just, and me, just me saying, hold on, was enough for people to go, oh, he likes rape. And I'm going, stop. I, that's not the case. So now that there has been. Um... What came out, yeah, once it came out, I made a public statement on Facebook. And okay. in public statement, I, I was very clear about it, uh, that he is not getting any uh, money from the book. So if you buy the Tiny Thinkers book that has him in it, you're not giving money to Lawrence Krauss. He offered to do that for free before any of this stuff came out. Um, the book is about Richard Feynman, 
uh, as a kid. It's basically a science story to inspire kids. And we tell the story of a young Richard Feynman. It's called Richie Doodles. Um, we did one about uh, Carl Sagan. We did one about um, uh, Darwin. And there's more coming out. We're featuring some female scientists and some African-American scientists. Uh, MJ Mouton is the author behind these. You can look it up, Tiny Thinkers. It's on Amazon. But mm. uh, I, I did a statement saying that he's not going to financially benefit from the books. And then I did a personal section where I was like, if he did what what is uh, he's accused of, it's horrific. And I hope his victims find uh, solace and peace. And um, I didn't outright say he's Satan. And I also didn't deny his victims. Um, I was more leaning toward, you know, I'm, I'm, I hope the people find peace and recovering if they were victimized. Um, and he, he hasn't spoken to me since I wrote that. So I've had no contact with him whatsoever. Um, that one is a little unique because we have that, that business tie in, right? The publisher, the distributors and the, mm. the author stuff. So, um, that one, that was a little unique. Also, I, I produced his audiobook for fear of physics and him and I did the voiceovers together. So I helped read the book. So I, I am connected with him on a, on, on a level. Um, I'll say that I think just candidly talking with you, I feel like maybe some people who don't pick up on social cues or come off as a creepy guy or don't really catch a hint or ask two or three times can be, or maybe just will reach out and grab when they're not invited to grab inappropriate, absolutely inappropriate sexual contact. Again, I don't think that should be qualified as a rapist. Call it what it is. It's inappropriate sexual contact. Perhaps mm -hmm. it's sexual assault by many definitions. Um, shouldn't be allowed, shouldn't be tolerated. So if that's who you are, if that's what you're doing, fucking stop it. Okay. All right. I um we've been talking for a really long time longer than i think we said we were gonna go an hour and <laughs> i don't you know what my shows are only three or four hours so i'm i'm good. Ah, all right as long as cool. you take a break i'm i'm good i have the, the stamina all right so, um this is my stamina. <laughs> all right well let's see um is there any um any more questions from the the chat maybe we can add we can take some questions from the chat and then probably wrap this up so do i have to be looking at the link you sent me in order to see the chat yeah i mean i can okay. read them anyway but um okay. yeah you'd have I, to I was, look. I was afraid of that double feedback thing happening so i didn't click yeah that. you're gonna want to uh, mute it as soon as you put it up gotcha Does this go out as a podcast by any chance as well? No, I, I don't do podcasts. Um, mm. I I mean, if you, I could, well, I guess we could talk about that later. Um, let's say. I was going to say I could share the audio of it as one of my episodes if you wanted me to signal booth it, but. Yeah, that's fine. I mean. I, I, um, at um, least it's food for thought, I think for people. Yeah. I haven't been recording, so I would need to, I would need to rip it from whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Um, I, can you see the chat? I'm going to it now. Mm. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to try to see how fast my mute finger is. I'm going to click this and then. Ooh, 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 I think I got it. All right. Ooh, I, where's the chat? Oh, here it is. Yes, I can see it now. Okay. Um, so the first uh, question. Well, no, Adam says, tell him, Adam says to go fuck himself. Okay. Yep. Um, um video are, why I'm such a wanker. Sorry, I can't with this guy. He's full of what makes the grass grow green. That would be shit. 
uh, I don't know why I'm such a wanker. I'll, I'll, I'll do some self-reflection and figure out why, why my wank meter is so high. Um, wow. Is there any, is there anything of substance we can get to? Um, well, Pascal says, uh, my question would be how is atheism mutually exclusive from any other tribe when it has prominent thought leaders like Sam Harris, which I, I think he means that when you have thought leaders um, and you sort of clustered around them, you become a tribe. I think that's that's how I, I read that question. Yeah, I think I think he's, he's onto something there. Um, and that's something that was a shock to me that happened while I was in the bubble. Like I, I was, I was a part of it and didn't realize how much of a tribe we had become. And it was shocking. And I, and I see the same thing. It's the hardest thing to see when you're in the bubble is the bubble. You don't mm -hmm. know it. It's like it's trying to explain to a fish what water is. This is our whole life. What are you talking about? So when I, when I would, I would have people at the table and we would, Someone would say, yeah, I'm a little more conservative when it comes to taxes. I think there should be a flat tax. And I go, I don't think there should be. Let's get an accountant on the phone and a CPA and let's argue about it. Let's talk. Let's have a healthy debate. That was always fun for everybody to talk about things we disagreed with. And then one time there was a Black Lives Matter protest that shut down an airport. And I had a Black Lives Matter activist in my studio. And I said, I think it's a, my opinion is it's a little too far to shut down an airport. And immediately it was. So you're okay with young black men being murdered in our streets? And I went, what? And I, I hit the brakes on this whole open dialogue thing and went, absolutely not. I would never be okay with that. Why would you think I would be okay with that? And I started to realize those days of being able to have a friendly disagreement with other liberal atheists was out the window. And it had that window has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. And I can tell you right now, um, I feel, I don't want to use the word safer because I don't feel unsafe in either situation, but I get much less attacks from Christians who sit across from me and tell me that they think I'm going to hell than if I have an atheist sit across from me and we have a political disagreement. So atheism didn't used to be this way, but Pascal's right. It has very much started to become tribalistic with its own little schisms. And that's, that's scary. Mm. Um, so Moo Moof would like to know uh, what's the difference between religious tribalism and atheist? I think religious tribalism, they have a set of directions. <laughs> and, and atheist tribalism um, is sort of a unique organic version of tribalism. Mm. Uh, and I think it's, I think atheists become more susceptible to it. And the reason I say that is because uh, I think that once you think you're immune from something, you're very likely to catch it. And atheists, especially those who at one point were religious, you said you've never believed. So those, those who came out of a religion look back at that past and go, oh man, that was back when I was tribalistic. That was back when I was convinced that, that you, you couldn't ask certain questions and, and uh, you, you couldn't challenge authority and you couldn't ask questions in church or anything. And you also, you couldn't think for yourself. Now I'm past all that. I'll, that'll never happen to me again. And then you end up, end up in these online groups and someone's attacking somebody and you go, yeah, you bastard. And you just jump on them and you get them and you have no idea who the person is. Uh, you don't have to show it on the screen if you don't want to, but number nine, the screenshot number nine I sent you mm. is from a woman, Judy, who there was, in the, there was a middle of a, they're in the middle of attacking me on some thread. And Judy says, I guess he's just going to have to go back to that six figure income work he used to do that he sacrificed in order to, she put this in quotes, change lives, poor baby. And then in parentheses, she writes, I've never heard of this guy before yesterday. And I still have no real idea who he is or what he did. Yeah. That's um, a shining example of atheist tribalism. She has no clue who I am or why everybody's mad at me, but she jumped on the train to call me poor baby. Why? Why the attack? She's a shark who got a drop of blood a mile away and came swimming at lightning speed to, to take her bite. It's a very right. organic type of tribalism. So two things. I'm not going to show any of the uh, things because there were names. They weren't 
um, always blacked out, I don't think. So, no, but they were using my name publicly. So why should we have to block out their name? Um, you're, you're, they may not be, um, public people though. Like, I don't know. Um, so obviously Christy Winters is public and, yeah. and you've brought her up and, you know, I don't have a problem with Christy Winters. I think that she's a great feminist. Um, so I should say that, um, she has her, like, she does her thing. I do my thing, but she's a very strong advocate for women and I, I truly support her and all of that. Um, but I just, you know, I don't, I don't know these people. So I don't know in many cases if they are public, like you're public and I'm public. And if people are going to say as they do, Chrissy Ossity's a bitch, uh, um, you know, oh. like, I don't care if people want to put that out or not, but like, somebody named judy who i've never heard of before i'm not gonna well but she posted it publicly and i think she actually posted that on my facebook page my 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 fan page um but i'll say this you don't have to show any screenshots you're not comfortable with in that video that i did with sargon if you want to skip all the crap at 31 20 31 minutes and 20 seconds we jump right into the screenshots and we start showing them so for anybody who wants to go see that without chrissy being um held accountable for showing names or whatever, then you can go look at that. Not that you want to send your people to Sargon, but the, I, I talk no. about- <laughs> but all right. <laughs> I, my, my online attack, we detail my online attack and we show the things people were saying about me 31 minutes and 20 seconds into that video. So do we have any more questions? Um, hi, David. Can you clarify how a group, which is made up of individuals, is somehow less valuable as a category than a single individual? That seems like a category error you've turned into an ideology. I'm not sure how I did that. If I, if, if that's the impression you got, I've not communicated effectively. Um, do you think she's saying, I'm assuming she, you said she, right? Uh, I don't know the gender of this person. Oh. I don't, I chaperone the great. I don't, I have no idea. If I said she, I might've misgendered the person. Uh, probably. Yeah. Who knows? I, I um it seems like it seems like what they're saying is that because I'm focused on the individual, I'm devaluing the group as a whole of women who are you know what I'm saying like your your thing was a lot of women are, are are not believed, and I'm saying, well, some men are falsely accused. Both can be true. I'm not saying one is more important than the other. That's never been my stance. Mm. So I don't uh I don't, I don't think one is more important than the other. I don't think one has value over the other. Okay. Um, I think, I think uh, there were some people who wanted to, to, it wasn't so much questions, but people were talking about the BLM thing. And I think that in my group, because there are leftists here, right? Like I'm a leftist. So the, um, the history of, leftist action is that um is that you don't get anywhere by being nice like there's a certain point where you have to sort of be disruptive in order to get attention um and even with that it, it's very difficult so you know um peaceful protests still have to have this often have to have this sort of civil disobedience. So if you say, don't do this protest, this type of protest, because it might shut down an airport or because you know there might be these sort of uh, consequences that aren't necessarily people getting, you know, uh, we're not necessarily talking riots or, or people being shot. We're talking about like um, infrastructure and inconveniences like that that is necessary in many cases to affect real change that would lead to um, to less young black men being shot by police, one hopes, because there is something like a 10 point, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I am getting tired, a 10 point, uh, 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 list of things that they're trying to accomplish the last time I knew. Yeah. So uh, I, 
I'm not, I'm not against civil disobedience. Um, I, 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 and this is, this is, this is part of the nuance that was lost in that show is that I, I was in favor of it. And I talked about being on board with like 98% of what BLM was doing at that time back then. Uh, I was completely on board with it. And I, I just said the airport thing was an issue for me because I had actually just met a little girl who was, I think 10 or 11 years old who had this debilitating disease. And anytime she had a flare up, she lived in Dallas, Texas. Anytime she had a flare up, she had to be driven immediately to the airport and they had to take an airplane at low altitude. Uh, she couldn't fly above something like 9,000 feet or something or her, her blood vessels would explode and they had to get her to Denver and do some sort of an emergency procedure. And they had to do this several times. And so immediately when I heard that an airport entrance was shut down, I thought of this little girl and I thought that you're going to have unintended consequences. You're going to have people, you know, doctors who were trying to fly to another country to do life-saving surgery and you're stopping that. You're going to have people who are trying to fly to Minnesota to see their grandmother before she dies and that person's going to miss their flight. Um, civil disobedience can happen in multiple ways. My personal interpretation was that the airport was making BLM look bad. Not that, not that inconveniencing a flight is more important than a black life. I would never say that, but I was accused of saying that when I didn't by skeptics. I think that it comes off that way. Like it, it, I'm just being honest with you. Like that's how. I don't know how that could possibly be the case because I, my, my whole point was, I want you to be effective in what you're doing. But if your actions are sending, uh, is putting out a bad marketing view of you, then you're, you're, you're sending the wrong message. So shutting down an airport and causing all of these other things to go wrong might be, uh, the news isn't going to be talking about Black Lives Matter. They're going to be talking about all the, the, the pain and destruction or people dying or whatever you're causing. So, my, my whole point was to help BLM be more effective or at least to help that activist specifically understand why some other people were saying you don't believe all lives matter. I don't agree with those all lives matter folks, but I was trying to help bridge that gap. It was a nuanced five hour discussion, but people would tune in for a few seconds and then immediately tune out when they heard something they didn't like and things were said about me that aren't true. I wanted to address something Bethany said. I happen to see it in the, in the chat. Um, oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't see Bethany at all. Okay. Yeah, Bethany Rhodes said in the video with Sargon, you also shared a post from a person with initials MN. It had nothing to do with you and was for the sole purpose of making fun of him and in turn disrespecting his wife. Honestly, Bethany, I have no idea what you're talking about. Your follow-up was, was that something you consider moral or just revenge? I'm just curious. I would be happy to address it. Um, I honestly don't know. If you can send me a message, like while I'm on this show, I'll try to remember what I did uh, and address it. Cause I don't, I, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't just try to, for revenge sake, make someone look bad. I don't, I don't know. I honestly don't know what you're talking about. Uh, if we get off of here and we don't get it resolved, I'll address it on my podcast or I'll just message you directly. But I, I don't recall doing that. I don't know what you're talking about. But I'm sure the I could address it. Post was about his past behavior. It was from his personal page. Um, are you on Twitter, Bethany? She'll probably respond in a second. It takes a takes a second for the chat to load. Hmm. Hmm. The post was about his past behavior. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I just now saw that. That's weird. I think you're seeing it way before I do. Oh. <clears throat> All right, so all right, so she's gonna email you, she says. So okay, email. I would love to get I'd love to address that. I, I can tell you now, I would never I would never do that just to humiliate someone. As a matter of fact, that's one of my arguments against Christians when we talk about hell. Um I talk about how immoral it is to only seek vengeance. If you're going to go at, at someone, it should be to improve their behavior, like the correction system supposed to do, which our prison system is absolutely horrific. But the idea is to make that person better and release them back into, into the population. 
Um, so this idea of hell being eternal is just torturing that person for vengeance. They're never going to get a chance to go do anything good. I talk about how immoral that is. So I would not participate in that behavior. So Bethany, please email me. I want to make sure we clear that up because I think there must be a misunderstanding. I would never operate that way. Okay. All right. Well, I think this is a good place to end. Um, I think on the whole, oh gosh, Gwendolyn just got here. You missed it. <laughs> Hi, Gwen. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> um, we're right now. We're um, we're discussing uh, how to help BLM get its message across. So that's how we well, are. <laughs> Just Adam kidding. Offered, Adam, Adam offered some really more, uh, some really good insight. He says, "Can you see me? Fuck you." That's good. He's offering some really good. I like Adam. I don't know how we can advance the discussion with that, but I I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. I mean, Adam doesn't, um, I've known Adam for a while. He doesn't mince words. I don't get um, it. I don't understand. Anyway, I, I have people sit across from me all the time who I disagree with. And I think I would like, you know, if we're wrapping up the discussion, my, my closing would be just that I, I, I want us to, as a skeptical community, as an atheist community, Let's, let's disagree and, and try to convince people that we have better ideas than they do instead of just going on the attack. 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I started in this community, I used to give talks to other atheists about when you sit down and talk with a Christian, don't attack them or belittle them or call them names because their ideas are terrible, even though they're if you want to classify what they teach their children as abuse or psychological abuse, I get it. They're doing harm. I, I agree with you, but attacking them and calling them names and putting them into boxes and speaking on behalf of them and telling them they believe things they don't believe, they're just going to shut down and not want to listen to you. And so I've been successful at having these types of conversations with believers. And now I see our own atheist groups doing it to each other. People are calling me stupid on this chat, this thread. They're saying, um, he's not intelligent enough to answer that question. Uh, what a fucking idiot. I mean, why? How does this how does this advance the conversation? Nothing that you're saying, like you're not going to say you're not intelligent enough to answer the question and then have me go, oh, well, I'm just going to sign back up for college. Like I'm not, I'm not going to, you're not going to have an effect on that. So I just, I want people to be able to sit down and have a respectful dialogue. And you know what? If you and I sit down and we, we watch the video from last year's MythCon and you say, that's terrifying, they're cheering for rape. And I go, I, I got the feeling that they were cheering for, for defiance. I want us to look at each other and go, well, here's why I think that. And you can say, here's my perspective. I want to listen to you. I want you to listen to me. And I want us to be able to go, we see this differently and move on. But that so rarely happens nowadays, especially in this community. It turns into, that's what you think? You know what? Fuck you. I'm going to go tell everybody what a piece of shit you are. I'm going to try to get you fired. I'm going to tell your network you're a fucking Nazi. And there's this huge attack on somebody's character instead of just being able to disagree. And you're not going to win friends that way or grow your movement that way. You're just going to keep seeking that perfect best friend until you're by yourself. And I just want, I just want us to be okay with disagreement sometimes. I really do. Um, all right. And, and I've heard you. Um, I do. I think that there are things that you can disagree productively about and ways you can disagree productively. But I also think that, you know, sometimes if you want to create a culture, you have to make choices and you have to tell people, what's not okay as well. And there has to be lines. And those lines can't be kind of wishy-washy the way that some people have made, tried to make them wishy-washy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm telling you right now, and I know that people, atheists who weren't in YouTube, who weren't in this sort of sphere, some of them really missed just how toxic it was. It, and it has been. It's incredibly toxic. 
And there's been nobody to stand up and say, we can't have this. This is driving people out of the movement. It's keeping us marginalized. You know, if you're concerned about the optics of BLM, I think you should be concerned about the optics of people cheering, um, you know, the sorts of things that they cheer for with Sargon and the kinds of things that he does and the kinds of things that some of these other people who are prominent atheists, especially on YouTube, uh, have done. And I think that we have to talk about um, connections with race realism and how that's not fucking okay. And that's not skeptical, bitch. Like that's, what are we doing? You know, why are we um, platforming some of the most heinous ideas? Oh, not you. I'm not saying you're doing that. I'm saying that that is something that has been happening with some members of the atheist or the skeptic community on YouTube. And that no fighting problem. back against this, let me tell you, I got it. Now, I, I let you speak quite a long time. <laughs> and I didn't yeah, interrupt. <laughs> I'm just going to agree with you. Um, it's been, uh, it's been hell for people. And there hasn't been anybody to stand up for anybody. And when you try to get somebody to to stand up and to uh, push back, you get, well, you know, or uh, like there hasn't, and it's not okay. And it's it's hurt people. Like people have been hurt. People have been driven away. People, um, I've had uh, Philip Moriarty, was uh, chased off of YouTube by people uh, threatening his children's lives. Uh, my friend, um, Natalie, had a great channel. She is, you know, mixed race, very passionate atheist, very passionate politically. And it, the constant abuse and like horrible abuse, like rape threats and nasty shit that you got. If you were a feminist who also said that you were an atheist, um, if you were a trans person who also said that you were an atheist, it was a constant, just soul crushing. You can look, I have a video about the C word and this had nothing to do with the atheist community. I made a video suggesting to other feminist men that probably they should look at the C word and maybe that wasn't you know, uh, against women. And maybe that wasn't something they should say. And I made, it was a polite video, right? It wasn't mean. It wasn't saying you're a horrible person. It's saying, this is why I think this would be a good idea for you to think about it. And if you want to look at the fucking comments, because <laughs> it got picked up by some of the supposedly skeptical community and just mocked. And now you can, you can look at some of the nastiest fucking things you've ever wanted to say. And most of them I deleted that were bad. You know, I mean, there's I'm been dogpiling, harassment, and vicious behavior and toxic behavior. And, and, you, and I, you and I are obviously on, I mean, we probably, our fans would probably say we're on two different sides of, of many issues, yet we're able to sit and, and have this conversation. Do you think, do you acknowledge that there is tribalism on both sides? Of oh, sure. All humans. Okay. We're, we're hairless monkeys. All of uh, us. That's what we are. So um, that doesn't mean that um, the tribalism is equal on all sides, and it doesn't mean that the, um, the toxicity in all tribes is going to be equal. And it, uh, I mean, that's not... So let me let me give you an example right here in in your own chat. Uh, whoever goes by Video Drone just made fun of me for being hit on by women and not and not telling. This is part of the shame that comes from the left. Uh, he called me, he or she called me David. Why won't hot women stop sexually harassing me? Smelly. Well, now that well, wasn't cool. No, this is the but this and and this is why I sent you all of those screenshots. Yeah. This is a perfect example of the tribalism on the far left 
that I would say is just like the tribalism on the far right. Um, you, you have a challenge for me. You go, David, I don't like that you said this. Why did you? Why do you hold that worldview? And I tell you, but John Brockman says, call Smalley out on his bullshit. That'd take all day. Because you know what? They're, they're not interested in resolution. They're interested in getting the cute comment that gets likes and for people to comment on it. And it's all just about who can get the attention before the chat thread disappears. You know, Jamie Kilstein came on my show and talked about his time as a hardcore leftist activist. He called himself a social justice warrior. I want you to know that. And I, I was like, take me, take me through a day. And he's like, you wake up, you see who we're attacking, and you go, you read it and go, oh, I could come up with something funnier than that. And then you attack in a new, fresh way to try to impress your friends that you can insult this guy. But, and I went, wait a minute. Do you not stop and research the article to make sure it's a credible claim against the person? He goes, no. I don't have time for that. Your friends are already popping off funny things about him on Twitter or Facebook. So you got to write the funniest comment to get the most likes. It's all well, I think I'm a pretty, I, I think I'm a fairly prolific, too prolific, a Twitterer. And I can be barbed. Like, let's not, I'm not going to fuck around and say it, I can't. But, I, you know, I, I just, I don't see that. I, I see people who do, I'm not saying everybody, like, like 90, um, you know, however many percent or whatever, I couldn't tell you. But, you know, people are reading, people are informed, people are at least, you know, I can, yeah. and I am in the people that I talk to. Like, I won't comment on something without reading an article because for no other reason. <laughs> And then I know how stupid I'm going to look, but you know, it's, I think we also have to respect that when somebody is from a marginalized group in the beginning, you have to be more careful. You know, you can't just like, Oh, I agree. It, I agree a hundred percent. As a matter of fact, my daughter who's 14, um, saw my, a video of my panel on social media and she goes, dad, what's intersectionality? And I went into her room where she has a whiteboard for her school. And I explained to her about how some people have multiple intersections of discrimination that they have to deal with. I've talked to her about third wave feminism. I talked to her about how women of color were somewhat ignored or outright ignored by the feminist movement. And so this idea of intersectionality came along. I mean, we got deep into it and I did a whole lesson with her about why it's important to take note of someone's intersections. I said, where it can become a problem is when it's abused or misused, when you don't just take it into consideration, but you then use that to silence people with fewer intersections. So of course, she's my daughter. I'm going to give her my take on it. But I explained it to her in detail to the point that she started doing her own research and coming in the living room and asking me questions about it. So I'm, I'm very open to these ideas. And I, and I explained to her too, I said, look, if I have a white male working for me and a black female lesbian who has one leg and who is in a wheelchair, I'm not going to talk to them exactly the same because they have different experiences. So I need to understand and be sensitive to their different uh, viewpoints while trying my best to treat them equally. And that can be the struggle sometimes. And I, I explain that to her. So, of course, when someone is marginalized, we, we need to take that into consideration. Absolutely. But I think some often use that as a tool to silence people they disagree with. And, and that's where I think it gets abused. All right. Um, well, I am. I really am tired. Like, I am not. Um, and I, I'm sorry to say it like this is. I'm several hours ahead of you. And so for me, this is pretty late. I'm a, I wake up really early because I have small children. Um, so I, I appreciate you coming on. Um, I think it sometimes this, uh, this discussion was, was tough, but for the most part, I think it, it's been civil um, and polite. Maybe, I don't know. I may look, I may read it back and uh, say, maybe I was too polite. I don't know. Maybe I wasn't. So <laughs> you, I, I think we just need to be careful to not signal boost things just because our friends are doing it and we trust them. Oh. It's just wait for evidence and facts. That's the only pushback thing you and I really had is that I think if you had not known me, I'm, a, I'm afraid that you would have been one of the ones sharing around this thing that you think I did when I didn't do it. And so I think that 
we just got to be careful not to fall into that tribalism that we go after the Christians for. That's, that's my own pushback for you. I think you've been great. I think you've been very respectful. Uh, your chat is, I think, a shining example of why I don't consider myself leftist anymore. Um, I, that, that tribalism, of no matter what I say, they're going to call me names. They're going to make fun of me. They're going to take low blows. They're going to call me stupid. This is what I expect to see in Christian chat rooms. This is what I expect to see in, you know, in, in people who have similar ideology, who are tribalistic and just want to go on the attack. I see the same thing on the far right. I see the exact same thing with Trump supporters. I'm trying to avoid all of that and be as unbiased and skeptically sound as possible and, and respectful to people who disagree with me. Um, and, and this is, this is what happens. You, you, you know, you come on, you be respectful. You say, I disagree, but I understand where you're coming from. And then you're called terrible things by, you know, by people on the internet. It's just, it's, um, I'm tired of doing the impossible for the ungrateful. You know, that's the, that's the quote I keep going back to. It's just, it's exhausting. Oh. You know? All right. Um, I've appreciated, you. I've appreciated you. Thank you for having me on. I'm glad we were able to have the discussion. All right. Uh, Bethany found the clip. So, you know, it's at 154.45 of the Sargon video. What is so, it? One what? 154. One hour, 54 minutes and 45 seconds. Should I go? You don't want to do that now, right? You want to leave and I can deal with it, deal with that later? Or do you want me to address it right here on this thing? Um, is, is Bethany, is this private information that we'll just be spreading more? Um, cause I'm gonna, I, I won't, well, I was gonna say, I won't say the person's name or whatever, but if it's, uh, um, 154, I may just be able to see it and tell you 154, what? Uh, 45. Okay. I've muted it so that I don't say anything. Oh, oh, M okay. I get what she's saying now. This, okay. I don't know what. Oh, okay. Yo, now, Bethany, thanks for this. So this was a person who is very public, by the way. Very, very public. Um, he had accused me of horrific things that I never did. And then he signal boosted the same thing Christy Winter signal boosted, the false accusation about me, um, said I was just awful, awful things he said about me. And this is a guy who I know has done stuff that was shady, underhanded. I did a private phone call with him and pleaded with him to stop. Uh, and I think he stopped for the most part, but he was price gouging people. He was doing awful things. It was a private one-on-one -on -one conversation. I didn't blast him publicly for it. And um, this was four years ago. It was a long time ago. And then he came out whenever that person falsely accused me. He started signal boosting it because we weren't getting along anymore. And he just wanted to bash me and awful stuff. So he started signal boosting it, saying that I was uh, a sexual predator and made all these false accusations about me and used that claim, shared that claim, then came and posted it on my own page, took the screenshot and started making public posts on my Facebook page telling people I'm predator uh i mean definitely crossed the line to be being able for me to sue him for defamation or for for slander for sure um definitely crossed the line and then like four days later he was busted for um or he was caught uh trying to have an affair uh and cheat on his wife and then he came out and posted this thing about it so i showed what he had done to me and then i showed his post where he was caught Oh, see, don't don't do that to to a Sargon crowd. Oh my goodness, these are people who you have to call the cops about when when they get oh. red meat thrown in front of them. Yeah, no. So it wasn't revenge. It was to show that these guys who will just a lot of times we see it all the time within the Christian community. The people who are so vehemently anti-gay and just attacking gays, attacking gays those are the guys who have a wide stance in the stall, you know what I mean? And then end up having to come out and go, okay, well, you were caught doing, you know, gay stuff. And so, oh, I see. You were so anti-gay. It was that thing. It was, he was so on the attack about me. He wanted so desperately for me to be this pariah, for me to be this mm -hmm. sexual predator. When all along, he was making a woman feel uncomfortable trying to get a woman to have an affair and cheat on his wife with her. 
and he was busted in the same thing. And so we showed the screenshot of that. And he, he made a public post about his, 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 him being caught doing that. And I just showed the screenshots back to back saying, this guy was attacking me a few days later. He was caught trying to, trying to basically manipulate a woman into having sex with him. So it wasn't a revenge thing. It was to say, this is the ideology that's attacking me. So yeah, it wasn't, there was no vengeance there at all. It was just. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that you meant it that way, but you're, it's, you know what Gamergate is, right? Like you, you're I, giving. I actually, I actually don't know what Gamergate is. I, I don't. Oh I've God. <laughs> I know. I've heard the term and I, I've heard the term okay. 4chan. I don't know what 4chan is and I don't know what Gamergate is. Oh God. All right. Um, <laughs> well, you got to be careful with Carl's audience. They will, uh, they'll go after you. So, um, and they can be vicious. So like, this is not like the chat. You think the chat was bad. That's nothing. Like that's, that's literally nothing. Um, compared to what's, what's going on there. And um, honestly, I'm going to, I, I feel like, and I wasn't here to, um, he wasn't here to like, you're not here to talk about Sargon. And I'm aware of that. Uh, so, uh, but I think I'm going to send you some stuff I've done about Carl in the past. And I, I might send you some stuff that I haven't made public before as well. Um, uh, and I, I wouldn't want it to be made public, but I, I am not without reason for uh, wanting, for thinking he's not a good person who should be in, in given a, uh, you know, a large platform in, in any community that, that is mixed in any way. But um, so, so, but I, I do appreciate you coming on here. Um, and uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for being open to doing this with me. Um, I, I hope <laughs> I hope we've gotten somewhere. I think we have. I don't know exactly where, but I think um, I, I think we've um, uh, uh, Bethany, uh, Bethany is in the the chat now. Um, and I, I don't I feel but, bad. For I feel bad for, for the people in the chat room. I really do. I think uh -huh. I just feel bad. For, I, I, I really like some of the most vitriolic hate is coming out of this chat room. And I, I just, I think these people have lost their humanism. They think that if we have a disagreement about something or an approach about something, we're coming at a different angle it's okay to completely dehumanize someone in the most disgusting way that, that one can be dehumanized through the anonymity of the internet. And it's just, it's concerning. Like I would never do that to someone. And um, it's, it's sad to me. And I feel like a lot of people, the further left you go in this sort of horseshoe idea, right? This horseshoe ideology, people on the far right, they're conservative. And then they start curving around and try to control the behaviors of women and, and sex with, through shame, through conservative principles on the far, far right. The left is doing the same thing. You can have left and liberal ideas. And then you start to become so convinced that your left ideas are so good. You're going to con control people's behaviors through shame. You're way more like the right wing people you despise than you think you are. If your, your MO is to see a disagreement and then go on the attack and forget all about your humanism. I'm, I'm not ashamed of having left leaning views and, and some centrist views. I'm not ashamed of that. Um, consider myself a liberal. I am a liberal. But watching my own liberal folks turn into this vitriolic hate mob that's focused like an outrage brigade to ruin people's careers and sp just spit the nastiest insults you can imagine at them. That's why I sent you the screenshots. It's shocking to me to watch atheists, <sighs> liberals, 
behave this way that we thought only the heart, the far right wing conservatives were capable of. It's, it's disheartening. And I, I feel bad for them. I just, I just I feel bad for them. Um, I, I think, I, honestly, I think that, um, I, I feel like in talking to you that you are, um, maybe it's because of your position in the atheist community. Maybe it's because you're a podcaster and, and not, um, on Twitter and not, you know, maybe not as close to certain marginalized groups, but I am on Twitter, um, or in certain places on Twitter or, or being a person who is marginalized on Twitter or on Facebook or, you know, having, um, the rise of the alt-right was something that certain people that are in this chat saw coming long before anything, uh, before anybody else. And I think we're, there's a lot of frustration about not being heard a long time ago. Um, it's, it has been difficult. Um, Uh, and there has been doxing and threats and people run off the internet, like yep. only to have other people turn around and say, well, you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. And I think that we need you know to that exact find same thing a happened, way. Right? That exact well, same thing happened to me and other people like me. Exact same thing, the doxing, the threats, the death threats, the contacting our significant others, talking about our children, Again, this is what I'm talking about, the horseshoe theory. It's the same exact thing is happening on both sides. I, I empathize with you. I'm not discounting it. I'm saying I agree and I connect because the same thing happens on this side. The folks that are like these people in your chat room that are saying these horrific things, when we hang up, when we're done, they, for some reason, feel fueled that their activism is going to be, how can I destroy his career? And these are the folks who contact my podcast one network and go, he's a part of a secret Nazi group where they contact and say, he's a rapist. And he, well, I don't look, don't, look at you were, you were talking about skepticism a minute ago. <laughs> well, maybe more than a minute ago, but you don't. And you were told telling me before when I said, um, you know, if you want to see what Sargon's fans actually think, go look in his comment section and you were like, well, no, that's not, you don't know that those are the same people. So I think you have to be. No, 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 I'm not saying, no, no, no. I'm not saying these are the same people that are doing it. I'm saying that these types of comments are just like the screenshots I've sent you. It's very similar. The same people, it's the same sort of ideology that I disagree with you. So I'm going to try to destroy your career. Like the bomb threat that happened at MythCon or the messages to my podcast network, or the doxing, or the contacting our family members. I mean, people don't just stop at a video. They will actually try to ruin you. For what? Because we have a, maybe we disagree on 15% of our politics? I, I don't understand the, I don't understand it. I, I hate that it happens to you, because I think you should have the right to say what you want to say on the internet without, without, having to hide your identity or, or, or being a fear of being attacked or whatever. You shouldn't have to go through that. I want to live in a world where we can have these open conversations, not have to hide our identities. And people go, I disagree with that guy. So I'm not going to listen to his show. Okay. But to, to be vitriolic and disgusting, you've lost your humanism. If you're doing that to either me or Chrissyosity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think we all have to think about what we want out of out of our cultures and out of our communities and how to best go about that. Like I, I'm I, I know that, you know, we're just arguing back and forth in circles now. Um, but I I don't if you platform people like Carl then don't bitch about insults. Like, you know, not saying you haven't, you yourself have, but like, if you aren't listening to people who are telling you that it's, that some of the people in your community are toxic and you're not 
like making a stand against them and then other people are like oh fuck off dude and you're like how how did we lose our humanism i don't like that's just not even useful because yes they're they're pissed people are pissed and they have well, the, reasons to be pissed well, and people are calling it, you're calling it not listening and and i would say i did listen and then i asked for evidence and i have been provided evidence before and stepped away from certain people other times I asked for evidence and then I was called a shit lord and a rape apologist and a Nazi and got doxxed and all this ridiculous shit started happening to me because I refused to out someone because I didn't have enough evidence to out them. So what is that? That's its own little form of cyber terrorism with somebody coming in and going, oh, you didn't do what I wanted you to do from the left perspective. So I'm going to try to ruin your life. These aren't just insults, right? These are people who take this shit offline and try to actually cause destruction. It happens on both sides of this, of this political spectrum and, and we just need more nuance. So I don't think we're arguing. I think I understand where you're coming from. I just want you to know that the vitriolic attacks, the hate, the, the mindless shit that you have to deal with, I deal with it too from people who support you. And I think that that's, we have to understand it to, as hum, one thing we definitely have in common is humanism and that we don't have a religion or a God that's going to come save us, that humanity as a whole is bigger than both of us and that we've got to work together as humans and nobody's going to look out for the other humans except other humans. That's our only obligation as humanists is to be there for other humans. And if you think a human is wrong about something, talk to them about it. Don't demonize them, try to get them fired, call them a piece of shit, make fun of them, mock them for being sexually assaulted like is happening in your chat room right now. Or, well, or well, certainly I would say to anybody who's a fan of mine, don't, don't go, uh, you know, I'm not saying that you would. I, I don't yeah. think that anybody. Um, I'm not even looking at the chat anymore. It's, it's just, it's yeah. just absurd. It's not even, it's not adding any value. It's not worth it. But, it's, so, but to anybody it's, out there. We've got to find our humanism. That's my point. Um, you know, obviously, I don't want anybody to attack anybody's livelihood or well-being, and that's not what I'm about. But people know. I, th you know, I really think that I hope that people know that about me. Um, but on that note, um, I, I think that it is midnight here, and I have to wake up really early. So if I can, if we can call it a night. Um, yeah. you probably are going to want to email Bethany and, you know, deal with that. Um, yeah. Bethany, and I, I'll look at my email for your message and I'll be happy to address it uh, any further. And I think you would plan to come on the show once we could definitely do that. We could have a conversation, Bethany, uh, just the two of us, if you want. And, uh, Christiosity, thanks for having me. I'm so glad sure. that we did. I'm glad that we talked. All right. And, um, you can certainly put the, you know, rip it do whatever you need to do to put this up put the audio up if that is something that you want to do that's fine yeah we you can use this do episode that the of the podcast if you want um sure. and uh i may have to put some ads around it because that's what my podcast network does but other than that i'll put it up just like it is yeah that's fine i don't i don't mo there, i'm not monetized so it doesn't matter to me <laughs> all right so cool all right and bye everybody um in the chat and anybody who's watching this in the future, um, bye.